Hey, y'all. Welcome to the stream. I am Proletariat Prince, and today is, what, it's Wednesday? It's Wednesday. And I have class tomorrow, which means... <laughs> Um, you know, it's, we, got, we got shit to do today. We got shit to do today. This is kind of the first stream that's going to be like this. Um, the first of many, maybe. I don't know. Um, I'm going to be synthesizing. Um, and so what that means is I'm in a class for my MA, um, you know, program, and... This class is called Literacies and Epistemologies. Um, I'm not going to explain that. I'm not going to explain. I'm just going to leave that there. It's Literacies and Epistemologies, and that's all you need to know. <laughs> um, and and so it, um, there are going to be various texts that I will have, you know, assigned as reading over the semester, and I want to share them with, you know, Twitch, with whoever's out there who wants to come. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This is like the first time that I've done something like this. And like I, I'm I've done, you know, um I've streamed kind of projects before. Um the the Dash project I did for a final last year. It was about the the Tumblr ban on um female presenting nipples and kind of like the 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 lead up and the fallout and all of the good stuff about that it's on my youtube um yeah it was it was it was it was a wild ride it was supposed to be like an hour or two hours and it ended up being like five i think um <laughs> Whatever, whatever it was, it was my longest, like, stream at, at that point. It was my longest stream. Um, and, you know, it was, it was pretty wild. It was, it was fun. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I came at this, you know, streaming with the, the idea that this is the trajectory, um, this is the direction where I want to go. Um, I just... <laughs> I didn't really know how I wanted to get there. And I think this is a good time as any to kind of, you know, try to get there. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, that probably doesn't make you feel any better about this. So anyway, what we are doing today, let's get down to it. I have three articles. I have, let's look at the page count. I have a 13 page article. I have a 10 page article. <laughs> I have a 21-page article, so we're reading, what, uh, 20, 10, 10, 40-ish pages, 45 pages, maybe? Um, it's not that bad. It sounds bad. It's not that bad. Uh, trust me. We, we have the, the screen reader to read it to us. We're going to be playing some viscera cleanup detail, um, and, you know, we're just going to see what happens. And maybe nothing happens. Maybe this is just a me listening to these texts <laughs> stream. Um, but then again, you know, maybe maybe interesting insights and interesting commentary is born out of this. Maybe, you know, enough interesting commentary to, like, you know, have this count for credit in my class. Because I actually am yeah, trying to get, you know, do something that will be counted for, you know credit in my class <laughs> um it's it's we're playing with genre we're playing with form we're playing we're playing that is what we're doing like i've said i said it yesterday i believe the best way for people to learn is through play so we are going to play um so yeah we're playing vistra cleanup detail and we are reading three articles today so let's get with it reading rainbow um, so our first text is Literacy as Translingual Practice. Um, yeah. One, one. Introduction. A Suresh Oh my gosh. The best way to understand the term translingual is by focusing on the sure prefix. I'm gonna have what to does trans do to language? Turn her... Firstly, the term moves us beyond a consideration of indi individual or monolithic languages to life between and oh across God, languages. Oh, that's so slow. I don't know if I could handle that. Go to the extent of defining okay, language look, as I, we're going to have it go this slow. Hold their on. Labels only just pause you for a moment. We're going to have it go this slow. Uh, if anybody shows up and needs it to be slower, we can do that. 
uh, we can do that. But this is going to make my hair fall out. It's, it's going to be painful. I, 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 like, I like them to be fast. Okay, let's just leave it at that. Okay, so I'm going to dump you over here. We are definitely unmuted. Let's see how loud Only in the context of ownership ideologies. See Blomert, 2010. Despite such labels and ideologies, okay, yeah, language sounds, resources always come into contact and actual use and shape each other. She sounds quite a bit louder than me, so... Can we... One, one. Introduction. Yeah. The best way to understand the term translingual is by focusing on the prefix. What does trans do to language? Firstly, the term moves us beyond a consideration of individual or monolithic languages to life between and across languages. Sociolinguists might go to the extent of defining language itself as constituting hybrid and fluid codes that earn their labels only in the context of ownership ideologies, see Blomert, 2010. Despite such labels and ideologies, language resources always come into contact in actual use and shape each other. From this perspective, we have to consider all acts of communication and literacy as involving a shuttling between languages and a negotiation of diverse linguistic resources for situated construction of meaning. Secondly, the prefix encourages us to treat acts of communication as involving more than words. We have to treat communication as an alignment of words with many other semiotic resources involving different symbol systems, i.e., icons, images, modalities of communication, i.e., oral, oral, visual, and tactile channels, and ecologies, i.e., social and material contexts of communication. There are good reasons why scholars are currently re-envisioning writing and literacy through the translingual lens. Before I articulate the shifts involved for literacy, and the new research challenges and pedagogical implications they raise, I must emphasize that the neologism translingual is indeed needed. Existing terms like multilingual or plurilingual keep languages somewhat separated even as they address the coexistence of multiple languages. From their point of view, competence involves distinct compartments for each language one uses. Similarly, in literacy, different languages may occupy different spaces in texts. However, the term translingual enables a consideration of communicative competence as not restricted to predefined meanings of individual languages, but the ability to merge different language resources and situated interactions for new meaning. Literacy as Translingual Practice, Between Communities and Classrooms, edited by Suresh Kanagaraja, Taylor and Francis Group, 2013. ProQuest eBook Central, http colon slash slash ebookcentral.pirocast.com slash lib slash humboldt slash detail dot action question mark doc id equal sign 11437144. Created from Humboldt on August 29, 2022, 504. Sure. Copyright, copyright 2002. A Suresh Kanagaraja. There. Construction. Competence is not an arithmetical addition of the resources of different languages. Competence is not. An... Okay, I kind of read this article already. But, um. <laughs> or not article, uh, paper. Competence is not an arithmetical addition of the resources of different languages, but the transformative capacity to mesh their resources for creative new forms and meaning. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be real. I only really speak English, and I, um, I, I've had a lot of problems trying to read other languages. So the thing that is really, um, for, like, understanding these, um that kind of really helps me and gets me through is always the concept of um memes okay so right you have how you normally would talk to people in your everyday life whatever language you use right or you know whatever combinations of right but then you have memes and memes are their own sort of discrete means of communication that can involve a certain amount of language but at the same time memes can often be experienced can be understood without needing to read you see the meme and you just know what that is you know um, referring to and um while you know I, I while it might be counterintuitive to think of this as a form of language i mean what is language except symbols that we all agree mean things right um when I was a kid, I read this book called Frindel, and this kid, um, his English teacher is like, uh, you can't ever make up new words. Words are what they are. They have to be those things all the time, right? Well, the kid is like, you know what? We're going to make a new word, and it's Frindel. And so a Frindel <laughs> is a pen. It's just a pen. And he holds up the pen, and he says, this is a Frindel now. And pretty soon, all the rest of the kids in the class are calling it Frindel. All the rest of the kids in the school are calling it Frindle. And then eventually, you know, at the end of the book, it becomes a worldwide phenomenon where this word that wasn't a word until this kid made it up, made it into the dictionary. <laughs> 
So, um, you know, when we're talking about um, the transformative capacity to mesh resources for creative new forms and meanings, um, it, it's, it's, making up new words is maybe a little bit simple, but at the same time, taking words or phrases or weird, obscure sounds that don't make sense to, to anyone and then combining them together to make something new that makes sense to everyone, right? Um, that is, I think that's what we're thinking about here. <laughs> it's a lot harder to do this, like, on paper, because I have ADHD, and it's very hard for me to keep track of, like, things that I've said. But anyway, um, feel free. Like, I, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's gonna, anybody's gonna join. I don't know if anybody's gonna be interested, but feel free to ask questions. Languages, because but the transformative... Questions help me formulate answers. <laughs> anyway, let's go. Transformative capacity to mesh their resources for creative new forms and meanings. Similarly, the term translingual treats textual practices as hybridizing and emergent, facilitating creative tensions between languages. The term also helps us go beyond the dichotomy mono slash multi or uni slash pluri. These binaries may give the impression that cross-language relations and practices matter only to a specific group of people, i.e., those considered multilingual. However, the term translingual enables us to treat cross-language interactions and contact relationships as fundamental to all acts of communication and relevant for all of us. In this sense, the shift in literacy is not relevant for traditionally multilingual students slash subjects alone, but for native speakers of English and monolinguals as well. Despite the novelty of the term, we mustn't think of the types of competence and practices implied by the term translingual as having merely pedantic or academic interest. The urgency for scholars to address translingual practices in literacy derives from the fact that they are widely practiced in communities and everyday communicative contexts, though ignored or suppressed in classrooms. Social relations and communicative practices in the context of late modernity featuring migration, transnational economic and production relationships, digital media, and online communication facilitate a meshing of languages and semiotic resources. Bazerman's chapter, CH2, outlines the social conditions which call for a literacy beyond separate languages and communities. However, we must remember that these practices are not new or recent. Translingual literacies have always characterized the practices of diverse communities in the past. Mao, CH5, and Morris Young, CH6, define the indigenous or the local as always creolized. Rainer, CH7, and Cushman, CH8, show how different Native American communities have developed traditions of education and literacy that involve a mesh. So, creolized. I believe creolized is when you have... Um, okay, so I think the common understanding of Creole is like, um, in the Caribbean, how you have like, uh, French Creole, right? And so it's the combination of different languages, um, different social practices, right? into a new language that doesn't necessarily, it's, it's not exactly like the old ones that it came from, but it is its own distinct and separate form of language, I think, I think, I might be wrong. So, so what we're talking about here is translingual literacies have always been characterized, or have always characterized the practices of diverse communities in the past, the indigenous or the local is always creolized. So, hmm. Social relations and communicative practices, context featuring migration, transnational economic and production relationships, digital media, and online communication facilitate a, message, a meshing of languages and semiotic resources. Semiotic is one of those words that's like, always, like, I always forget what it means. Oh, I forgot to turn that off. Which you'd think that I would, like, know that by now. Okay, signs and symbols. That's, that's what I was talking about. Okay, that's exactly what I was talking about. So, a meme is a symbol, and the symbol represents some kind of meaning. So it is a form of communication, a form of language, I would argue. Um, so, to facilitate a meshing of languages and semiotic resources. Okay, the twitch emotes, twitch emotes. Okay, 
There's this thing, no, there's this thing that I was reading. I, I keep seeing people posting, and it's probably becoming a meme at this point, um, about how they, like, accidentally said, like, poggers in real life, right? And so, on Twitch, you know, I shout pog at the fucking computer all the time. <laughs> Maybe not all the time, but, you know, I have, I've done it in the past, and I was immediately like, oh my god, what the fuck did I do? But, um, you know, there, there's emotes, right? There are Twitch emotes, and these emotes have very specific meanings, and you type the emotes out as words in the text, and they show up as pictures on the screen, right? Okay, well, um, the, the meshing of languages and semiotic resources, right? So we are using digital media, Twitch, and online communication, Twitch chat, to facilitate a message, meshing of languages, that's you know, whatever language you speak in with your, your stream, chat, right? And semiotic resources, so emotes. <laughs> and the emotes are simultaneously indistinguishable from uh, language because they are represented by words, right? Um, but they're also little pictures that represent the words, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I have a point. I'm making a point here or if I'm just talking about things. I think I'm just talking about things. Um, for academic interest, let's keep going. the urgency for scholars to address translingual practices and literacy derives from the fact that they are widely practiced in communities oh. and everyday communicative, everyday communicative contact literacy as translingual practice. Oh my god. I hate it when she does this. Okay. And then off. So... Facilitated message. Uh, however, we must remember that these practices are not really recent. Uh, the indigenous or the local, as always creolized, uh, show different native. I think this is where. Uh, Everyday com communicative content. We even changed. Why is creolized? Rainer, CH7, and Cushman, CH8, back, show how it. different Native American communities have developed traditions of education and literacy that involve a meshing of language and cultural resources, including those of the colonizer. This orientation is backed Wait. by historiographical research on pre-colonial practices in South Asia, Kupchandani, 1997, and Africa, Makoni, 2002. Post-colonial communities such as Lebanon, Uayash, CH9, and Kenya, Malu, CH10, are drawing from local translingual traditions to absorb colonizing languages and fashion creative literate and communicative practices. The objective of this book is to learn from these community practices whether the late modern West or pre-colonial Orient, and many traditions and places in between to enhance literacy education in pedagogical contexts. Translingual literacies are not about fashioning a new kind of literacy. Okay. It is about understanding the practices and processes that already characterize communicative activity in diverse communities to both affirm them cool uh we need <laughs> options menu control mouse always run always run oh god okay right to interact with something I, I think you're supposed to be able to, like, download these in your... Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, I think it's the, the thing on the wall. Where's the thing on the wall? Oh, no, I'm leaving footprints everywhere. Okay. Okay. I mean, now that I figured that out, let's just play. Them and develop them further through an informed pedagogy. It is not surprising, however, that scholars are still struggling to define these literacies and implement relevant pedagogies. Having defined literacy according to monolingual ideologies since modernity, they have to now revise their understanding to conceive of literacy as translingual. With hindsight, scholars have now. Literacy as translingual practice, between communities and classrooms, edited by Suresh Kanagaraja, Taylor and Francis Group, 2013. ProQuest eBook Central, http colon slash slash eBook Central dot piroke, copyright copyright 2013, introduction 3. Started analyzing how ideologies that territorialized, essentialized, and circumscribed languages came into prominence around the Enlightenment and Romanticism, especially in the thinking of those like Johannes Herder and John Locke, C. Baumann and Briggs, 2000, Blomert and Bershorin, 1992. With the colonial enterprise, these ideologies have also migrated to other parts of the world, often imposed as literacies more conducive to science, rationality, development, and civilization, threatening diverse local translingual practices. 
This ideological work of monolingualism is still unfinished, displaying feverish and concerted efforts in countries like the United States, as linguist Michael Silverstein, 1996, has shown. With the monolingualist paradigm becoming difficult to sustain under the fascinating technological developments and irrepressible social mobility which engender different communicative practices, we are now ready to travel back in time or to other places to reconstruct new scholarly constructs. Compositionists started theorizing these literacies from a product-oriented perspective earlier. The hybridity of texts oh, in community God. and student writing understandably attracted their attention and called for a different explanation. Labels like Altdis, Schroeder, Fox, and Bizzle, 2002, Hybridity, Bizzle, 1999, and Code Meshing, Young, 2004, that dominated discussion in composition circles were an attempt to understand the politics and poetics of such texts. Though these textual products still have a lot of resonance to certain communities, i.e., African American, Hispanic, and post-colonial, there has also been some questioning as to the extent to which they are desirable for others. Some communities fear that such hybridization of codes will lead to the dilution of their language resources and identity and threaten their sovereignty, as Lyons, 2009 has argued on behalf of Native American communities. Some argue that the values attached to the ver, vernacular and the dominant languages are different in their communities, and express a desire to reserve different codes for different functions, rather than meshing them, as Milson White argues in CH11. More importantly, valorizing difference in texts has created the impression among students and scholars from dominant communities, Anglo-American, in the U.S. context, that a text in standard English lacks creativity or voice, as addressed in Lu and Horner, CH3, and Bu Ayash, CH9, in this volume. Minority students might also go away with the impression that something approximating dominant conventions are disempowering. While code meshing will remain important for certain students and communities for voice, and the chapters by Malu, CH10, and Bu Ayash, CH9, show that it will continue to be practiced in post-colonial communities and characterize popular media such as hip-hop and social networking sites, and will generate more debates on its politics and pragmatics, as we feature in part 3 of this book. With a spirited defense of code meshing by Verhong Young, CH13, some scholars feel motivated to develop a paradigm of translingual relations that moves beyond valorizing hybrid texts. A translingual orientation emphasizes that what we treat as standard English or monolingual texts are themselves hybrid. These labels are ideological constructs that mask the diversity inherent in all acts. Literacy as Translingual Practice, Between Communities and Classrooms, edited by Suresh Kanagaraja, Taylor and Francis Group, 2013. ProQuest eBook Central, oh http colon slash slash so e .com. Copyright Copyright 2013. Taylor and Francis Group, for a Suresh Kanagaraja, of Writing and Communication. Consider that in each act of communication the semiotic resources we use are recontextualized for the purposes and participants in that activity, with their own resonance. If code meshing draws attention to difference, the translingual orientation also emphasizes difference in similarity. That is, it makes us sensitive to the creativity and situatedness of every act of communication, even in seemingly normative textual products. In this sense, translingual practice is emerging as a term that accommodates hybrid practices without ignoring the inherent hybridity in products that appear on the surface to approximate dominant conventions. The orientation thus enables us to discern agency and voice of both multilingual and monolingual writers in textual products that have like, varying relationships to the norm. There's some words that I think I'm like conditioned to hear, and I'm just like, hmm, yes. In this sense, trans translingual practice is emerging as a term that accommodates hybrid practices without ignoring the inherent hybrid hybridity in products that appear on the surface to approximate dominant conventions. Mm -hmm. That, that's, okay. I'm 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 trying to think of an analogy for this, but it's like it's it's kind of um code meshing draws attention to difference. The translingual orientation also emphasizes difference in similarity. That is, that is, it makes us sensitive to the creativity and situatedness of every act of communication. Creativity and situation situatedness of every act of communication. So right here we're talking about um well, situatedness, I think, would be, like, discourse, right? So, we are speaking in a particular place at a particular time for a particular reason. And then creativity um, is... Oh, jeez. Is how we... And Consider that in each act of communication, the semiotic resources we use are recontextualized for the purposes and participants in that activity. So, okay, so I'm 
trying to think of something. I'm trying to think of the. I'm trying to think. Um. Their own resonance. So, um, if you're. Oh no. If we are. Hmm. So that would be the the emotes, right? And emotes have generally generally agreed upon meanings, right? When we look at a smiley face, that's not that's not an emote. That's just a I don't know what's it called emotic emoticon. Whatever, whatever it is. I think it's basically an emote, isn't it? It's all the same. Um, when we look, when we send someone a smiley face, right? That smiley face can have a lot of different meanings, right? Um, and we now have a lot of different smiley faces to to you know communicate those different meanings. But you know, it used to be, <laughs> and we didn't have the little yellow circles. We had like you know two dots, a smiley face thing, right? Well. Um, it's a it's a parenthesis. Um, but anyway, <laughs> what am I saying? Um, so that smiley face could mean oh oh no, uh, that smiley face could mean a lot of different things in a lot of different situations, right? So if you send if your friend says you or sends you a text and they're like, I had a lot of fun at the concert tonight, and you send a smiley face, right? That means me too. <laughs> uh. If your friend sends you a text and says, I really hate it when my dog keeps me up at 2 a.m. barking, um, and your friend and you send your friend a smiley face, right? That's that's an appropriate context. It's still an appropriate context to send that smiley face because it has a different meaning, right? Different symbols have that have the same meaning, have different meanings for different situations. So, um, I, I've, I've been using this one a lot lately. The word rewards, rewards and consequences. Now, you would rather have rewards than you would have, would, would want to have consequences, right? You completed the job. Now you're going, excuse me. You completed the job. Now you're going to have rewards. You completed the job. Now you're going to have consequences. You would rather have the rewards, right? But we can also say you completed the job. There are consequences. And we can also say... You didn't complete the job and now there's going to be consequences. So we are using semiotic resources, that means symbols, meanings, words, right? For a, and we are recontextualizing them, we are changing how they are used for the purposes of an activity, of communication. Um, so code matching draws attention to difference um, the translingual orientation also implies difference in similarity. I, that, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a hard one. But how, let's see, let's go back even more. <laughs> um, what we treat as standard English or monolingual texts are themselves hybrid. Okay, yes, no, because English itself is a hybrid language. English, many languages are, in fact, hybrid languages. English is a language that is made up of many other different languages. English borrows words from other languages and doesn't give them anything back. So, English itself is not necessarily monolingual in the way that I think we, we would tend to see it, right? Um... These labels are ideological constructs that mask the diversity inherent in all acts of writing and communication. Yes, there is, once again, there is no such thing as a pure language. Um, English is always going to absorb more words from different languages. But English is also, and this is where we get into like um, Creoles, this is where we get into AAVE, it's also going to be transformed by people who use it into different things. 
right? So we have AAAV, or no, AAVE, sorry. <laughs> we have um, uh, just like slang. Um, we have Californians say hella, right? Um, people outside of California don't really say hella, apparently, but Californians say hella. Um, and, and this is a way that English is transformed and changed. Even, you know, within, like, languages change. Languages change. That's, that's the basic point. I don't know. <laughs> I lost, I lost the point like halfway through. Um, but we'll, we'll try to find it again. Okay. Consider... Um, or recontextualize for purposes and participants with their own resonance. Code meshing draws attention to difference. Translingual orientation also emphasizes difference and similarity. I still don't know what that means. So if uh, code meshing, okay, so code meshing is when you speak English, right? But you also speak AAV. Uh, it's when you speak uh, Spanish, but you also we're, I, I'm, I speak English, so we're just going to go with Spanish and English, right? Two different languages, and you bring them together. And so, um, Gloria and all the, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, um, but she, uh, I, I was, I've been assigned to read, you know, a bunch of papers by her, and she, what she does is she will be writing in English, and then she'll include, like, a phrase in Spanish. And it's like... You know, I personally don't know what that means. I can, I can Google it and find out. Um, but she does, and she is effortlessly switching between these things, these languages, these, um, you know, yeah, these languages, and, and combining them to create, I mean, almost new meaning, if you want to think about it like that. Um, but at the same time, it's not really new meaning because we already we already do that. We do that every day. We have we um you know, I think we all have um our own um Twitter speak. If you're on Twitter and you do Twitter speak. Twitter I I I haven't been on Twitter very long, so I'm not the expert yet. Yet. But talking to people on Twitter is rhetorically speaking very different from talking to people in real life um and i think that i think that goes the same for like most interactions on the internet because there are different oh jesus fix my light and now somebody's outside slamming things in the parking lot of course that would happen right now um communicating with people on the internet i mean and it, we can even go like to writing itself writing to people um, rather than like speaking to them in person, involves, you know, a different rhetorical skill than just speaking to them, right? Um, I can talk my ass off, um, but can I, in paper, you know, create a argument that someone else can both understand and also, um, I don't know, not, it, you know, it's more than just understanding. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to say that a lot. I'm going to say that a lot, okay? Be prepared for that, because I'm going to say that a lot. But no, uh, yeah, so like, the difference in similarity. It, there's difference. And there's similarity. Um, it's just that we don't... Well, it's all about norms, right? Because the norm is, is standard English. And, you know, we are... When we say, you know, the norm is standard English, we are constructing a reality where there is, in fact, a standard English. And, like, sure, there is a standard English, but at the same time, that standard English has gone through a lot of change in the past hundred years. Like, a person, you go talk to a person a hundred years ago with, you know, all the things that we say today. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, people talking about, 
um, <laughs> historical movies, and they're like, okay, they got the clothes, they got the hair, they got the shoes, they got the wig, the, I already said hair, so you can't say wigs again, they got the, the, the cars, transportation, they got the, you know, the horse shit in the streets, if there's carriages and horses, right? But they don't have the language, <laughs> right? Um, that's because language, I mean, just 50 years ago, language has evolved and changed. Um, maybe not to the point where it's unrecognizable, but, <laughs> um, you know, start talking to your friends like you're in a Shakespeare play and see what they think. It's gonna be weird for them. I I'm sorry for your friends now. Um, <laughs> don't do that. Please don't do that. Oh, God. Um, but anyway, so yeah, language changes, and so yeah, in this sense, translingual practice is emerging as a term that accommodates hybrid practices without ignoring the inherent hybridity in products that appear on the surface to approximate dominant conventions. Okay, so once again, we have the dominant, we have standard English, right? And it appears that the way I talk approximates standard English, but it doesn't. Because I don't know if Shakespeare used contractions. And I just said doesn't. So there we go. <laughs> um, but at the same time, we also do have people like um, um, Gloria. I'm sorry. I, I don't have her name in front of me, so I can't say it. Um, Anzal Dua. I, uh, but anyway, we have, you know, her. And she's, you know, out here. Speaking, or no, not speaking, writing in both, you know, English and Spanish. I believe Spanish. I believe she is, or she was uh, Chicana. But anyway. Tea time. Oh my god, this, this talking shit really takes a lot out of me. <laughs> um... The orientation thus enables us to discern agency and voice of both multilingual and monolingual writers and textual products that have varying relationships to the norm. Hmm. So, being able to understand hybrid practices and inherent hybrid hybridity allows us to understand how people are choosing to use language. And the choice of how to use language is very much a, a rhetorical choice. I choose to speak in emotes on Twitch because that is, it's, it's a rhetorical choice that will get my point across better than if I chose to write like Shakespeare. <laughs> um, I choose to... Uh, use contractions, say don't or didn't, when I'm talking in everyday life, because this is how I, I speak in a way that is more natural and more clear to, for other people to understand my meaning. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> um, is, is it clear when I say don't and didn't instead of did not and do not? I don't know. It'd be an interesting thing to, to think about. But anyway, um, so yeah, we are, it, it's all about our rhetorical choices, our rhetorical purposes, our exigence, if you will. <laughs> what are we trying to say? And what are, what we are trying to say is almost just as, poor, as important, not just what we're trying to say, what and where we are trying to say something, what we're trying to say, where we're trying to say it, and then, and then who we're trying to say it to, of course. Um, and then there's something else that was the point that I was getting to. I lost it. Fuck. It's gonna happen a lot. This is gonna happen a lot, but that's okay. Um, what are we, where are we on time? Oh my god, it's been 42 minutes already. And this is just like one annoy. paper. However, there are different facets okay. to the term translingual the that need to be unpacked. Initially, some scholars presented the term translingual as an orientation to writing and literacy, see Horner ETAL, 2011, and Lou and Horner, CH3 this volume. From this perspective, it is not a text but an approach to texts. 
This definition is sufficiently broad as to accommodate the metalinguistic and cognitive awarenesses involved in such literacy. It emphasizes the attitudes and perspectives that need to be cultivated toward cross-language relations in literacy. For teachers, it encourages a way of looking at the implications for writing and teaching from an awareness that languages are always in contact and complement each other in communication. As we proceed to narrow down this orientation, we have started focusing on the practices that constitute translingual literacies. We have started asking what strategies characterize the construction and negotiation of meaning in such forms of literacy. Monolingual ideologies have relied on form, grammar, and system for meaning-making, motivating teachers and scholars to either ignore strategies and practices or give them secondary importance. A translingual orientation requires an important shift to treating practices as primary and emergent, as form is so diverse, fluid, and changing that it cannot guarantee meaning by itself. The focus is now on social agents who give meaning to... Hold on. Mean uh, monolingual ideologies have relied on form, grammar, and system for meaning-making. Motivating teachers and scholars to either ignore strategies and practices or give them secondary importance. Okay. What the heck does that mean? We've started asking what strategies characterize construction and negotiation. We have started asking. Oh my god. Okay, let's start at the beginning of this paragraph. As we proceed to narrow down this orientation, we have started focusing on the practices that constitute train translingual literacies. We have started asking what strategies characterize the construction and negotiation of meaning in such forms of literacy. Monolingual ideologies have relied on form, grammar, and system for meaning making. Moving teachers and scholars to either ignore strategies and practices or give them secondary importance. Okay, so form, grammar, and system rather than strategies and practices. So, rather than um, strategies, so strategies would be like rhetorical strategies, maybe? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, and practices, um, the, rather than the social aspect, this is the, it, strategies and practices is the social aspect of language, the, the social, um, practice of, of communi communication, um, so that would be poggers, right? Something is poggers. We know what that means. We do not need to have the grammar of the poggers. We do not have the grammar of the poggies. We just have, you know, po it's poggers, dude. Fucking poggers, man, right? Um, but form, grammar, and system would say, is that a capital poggers or a lowercase poggers? <laughs> Does that poggers have a period at the end? Shouldn't we be italicizing the poggers in this instant to make sure that it is, you know, properly emphasized? Um, did you cite your poggers? <laughs> this, it sounds silly, right? Um, but, uh, you know, form and grammar and system, right? That, that's what we're talking about, right? What is the aesthetic of your poggers rather than the substance of your poggers? Um, I like, okay, maybe there's times when the grammar is important, you know, we need punctuation, yada, 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 but when I'm talking to you, I don't need to say period. Imagine if every time I said a sentence when I was talking to you, I said period, period. Just like try doing that for an hour, it would drive your, you out of your goddamn mind. Um, and, and okay, like when you're writing a paper, right, it's, it's hard to like, separate things into distinct thoughts without periods, maybe, right? Or is it? Period. I don't know. Period. Let's find out. Period. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Okay. There, there, is, there is a grammar that is kind of implicit, implicit in the spoken word that does not, that require, you know, that, that, that re is required... Requires a little bit more work in the written work, okay? Let's put it that way. You know? Um, when what's really important is, is the strategies and practices. Can you see the highlights? We can see the highlights. That's fun. That is very fun. That is very sexy. That is very cool. I'm kind of concerned that my, like, professor is going to be watching this, but at the same time, I think I kind of talk like this in class already. Which is a weird thing to admit and acknowledge. I need some water.
Okay, let's go. Meaning to language resources, of course, building on the traces of meanings they bring from their prior use, in situated literacy practices. Such meaning has to be constructed and negotiated through strategic practices, as intelligibility and success depend a lot on collaboration. Many of these practices are developed through socialization and are often intuitive to all of us. Hansen, CH19, develops a pedagogy to tap into these intuitive strategies by encouraging her native speaker students to decode multilingual websites for their research. Strategies such as guessing the meaning from contexts and other semiotic cues, such as fonts and images, reflect those that multilinguals use in other contact situations, see Kanagaraja, 2007. Lorimer, CH15, and Weibel, CH4, discuss other such strategies from their research. We have only scratched the surface in understanding the practices of trilingual literacy. More progress in this front will help us devise practice-based pedagogies that don't focus on codes and norms, but strategies of production and reception of texts. Literacy as Translingual Practice, Between Communities and Classrooms, edited by Suresh Kanagaraja, Taylor and Francis Group, 2013. Hold on, hold on, hold on! Their research. Oh, Strat come on. So we have more progress in this part will help us devise practice-based, practice-based pedagogies that don't focus on codes and norms, but strategies of production and reception of text. So that would be, um, Strategies of production. We earlier we said, oh, here we go. Strategies of guessing the meaning from context. So guessing the meaning from context instead of, um, okay. So consequences, right? Consequences has the the you know the hard line dictionary meaning that is, um something that results because of something else, right? But then it also has the the social connotation, the social context of there will be consequences for your bad actions, right? So guessing the meaning from context is that, is that, is um, instead of saying consequences means, dictionary definition, it's consequences kind of maybe generally means that, but also has very specific uses in context, right? So then, uh, fonts and images, so you know, emotes, <laughs> reflect those <laughs> that um, multilinguals use in other context situations, um, discuss other strategies from their, oh yeah. So this, but you're gonna see a lot of these lists of names and very rarely do we actually go read that. Like we, do sometimes but not really because uh, there would there would be so much reading if we read every single thing that somebody referenced I would I would die and I read a lot we've only scratched the surface and understand the practices of trilingual ooh, trilingual literacy I don't even I can't even oh my god uh, I know like okay I know English I've taken two higher education courses in German, and I still probably, I, I'm, I would still probably grade test worse than a kindergartner at speaking German. I can maybe kind of sometimes possibly give you directions. Um, we have only, so we have only <laughs> scratched the surface and understand the practices. I, I would not, I would, oh my god, I would just, I would not even. Um... More progress in this front will help us devise practice-based pedagogies that don't focus on codes and norms, but strategies of production and perception of text. text. So rather than writing to write, we are writing to be read. Maybe. 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 No. Uh, well, also, we're writing, instead of writing to write, we're writing to be read, but also, instead of reading to read, we are... We're, we're reading, I don't know, I lost that, that that just flew out the fucking window, man. Uh, but I, I, know, I know what I'm trying to say, right? I know what I'm trying to say. We, we are, um, we are analyzing things rather than consuming things. And I think there's a difference between analyzing something and consuming something. Because there is a little bit of analysis inherent to all consumption, that is true. But... Anal or consuming with the intent to consume and consuming with the intent to analyze is a lot different. 
Um, and we're we're in English, so we're going to talk a lot about consuming, you know, consuming, um, with the intent to criticize, with the the intent for criticism, for you know, literary criticism, which isn't like ah, I think that's bad. It's this thing means a thing, and this other thing means a thing. What do these things mean together? Why does this mean what it means? How does it mean what it means? Who does it mean what it means? <laughs> Where does it mean what it means? Which is, I think, that's kind of something we're doing now. Where does that mean what that means, right? Um, so, practice-based pedagogies that don't focus on codes and norms, right? So, like, what, it, uh, excuse me, you did not capitalize this word right here. Your entire argument is wrong, which is probably something you've encountered on the internet if you've ever argued with anyone on the internet. Um, excuse me, you did not include this particular piece of punctuation. What, so that you, you didn't read what I actually wrote, you just read what I responded to you, like you read my, what I, you know, my response to you to just like grade it? it? Are we in grade school? Are you my teacher? Do I need to bring you an apple tomorrow? What? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. And we're not talking about codes and norms. We're talking about strategies of production. And reception. How do we tell people the things we want them to know, and how do we hear what people are trying to tell us? There we go. That, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good way to put it, I think. Um, continue to read from here. More progress no. in this front will help us develop literacy. Go. Trans go. Copyright, I read that like three introduction times. five. We need to focus on practices rather than forms because the translingual orientation treats heterogeneity as the norm rather than the exception. In monolingual ideologies, meaning is guaranteed by the uniform codes and conventions a homogeneous community shares. When we move beyond founded communities and consider communication at the contact zone, whether in pre-colonial multilingual communities or post-modern social media spaces, we are unable to rely on sharedness for meaning. It is practices that help people negotiate difference and achieve shared understanding. Practices therefore have an important place in translingual literacy. Radcliffe's, 1999, notion of rhetorical listening is an insightful articulation of the listening slash reading strategies one has to adopt in order to communicate across difference. We need more knowledge on the speaking slash writing strategies to facilitate such negotiation. Just as these negotiation strategies are developed through socialization in con. Tact zones and multilingual communities, we are also finding that people are bringing certain dispositions that favor translingual communication and literacy. These dispositions similar to Bourdieu's, 1977, concept of habitus constitute assumptions of language, attitudes towards social diversity, and tacit skills of communication and learning. Examples of such dispositions include an awareness of language as constituting diverse norms, a willingness to negotiate with diversity in social interactions, attitudes such as openness to difference, patience to co-construct meaning, and an acceptance of negotiated outcomes in interactions, and the ability to learn through practice and critical self-reflection. Lorimer uses the term rhetorical attunement, CH15, to describe such dispositions among her multilingual subjects. Weibel also shows how a different set of attitudes and orientations comes into play in the world social forum where people can simultaneously use their own languages and still achieve semantic and social understanding. Pedagogical reports of others like Lou and Horner, CH3, Hansen, CH19, and Kral Lanu, CH21, also demonstrate how these dispositions help their students to negotiate cross-language relations without teachers having to instruct them on such negotiation strategies. What we are finding is that even native-slash-monolingual students are socialized into such dispositions in networking sites and online interactions which compel them to negotiate language diversity effectively, see Williams, 2009. As we discover more of these dispositions and formulate them in a systematic manner, we may gain new insights into pedagogical POS abilities. Teachers don't have to assume that translingual literacy has to be taught afresh to their students. They can tap into the dispositions of their students for such interactions and explore ways to scaffold them for further development. Among students who lack adequate socialization into multilingual and contact zones encounters, teachers may consider working at the level of attitudinal shifts and language awareness to prepare them for such interactions. Another direction in the effort to unpack the translingual orientation is the realization that this kind of literacy is intrinsically rhetorical. Multilingual words gain their logic and uptake in relation to the rhetorical objectives, participants. Literacy as translingual practice, between communities and classrooms, edited by Suresh Kanagaraja, Taylor and Francis Group, 2013. ProQuest eBook Central, http colon slash slash ebookcentral.pyrocase.com slash lib slash humboldt slash detail dot action question mark doc id equal sign 1143 copyright copy 6a Suresh Kanagaraja. Setting, and interests concerned. In fact, uptake is primarily about persuasion i.e., persuading listeners slash readers on the appropriateness of one's semiotic choices for one's purposes. Weibel, CH4, Mao, CH5, and Morris Young, CH6, consider how we can better understand the rhetoric of translingual communication. 
Such a rhetoric involves certain ethical values suitable for negotiating difference, not dissimilar to the notion of dispositions introduced above, and certain negotiation strategies, also discussed earlier, for reception and interpretation. In terms of production, this rhetoric involves processes such as recontextualization, whereby semiotic resources from diverse languages and cultures are reconfigured for one's purposes. As these are rhetorical processes, we are compelled to treat translingual literacy beyond the narrow bounds of language norms or textual structures and situate them in larger contexts of history, culture, and social relations. A particularly important construct such rhetorical considerations are developed. Ing for translingual literacy is the constitutive and emergent role of place slash space. Place is important in a definition of translingual literacy, for several reasons. As we move away from considering literacy as shaped by grammatical norms and formal considerations, with their own intrinsic logic or meanings guaranteed by an autonomous structure, we have to ask what we can ground such forms of communication and literacy on. In this exploration, we are now beginning to see the material context that was earlier bracketed off as insignificant emerging as constitutive of meaning. The material context shapes literacy and communication material in profound ways. Context. While geographical Hold slash up. physical Hold place Hold contextualizes up. literacy, okay. even more influential are the social negotiations and rhetorical encounters. Okay. The material context shapes literacy and communication in profound ways. The geo while geographical physical place contextualizes literacy, even more influential are the social negotiations and rhetorical encounters that create alternative spaces for creativity and understanding. What does that mean? That means that no matter where on earth you are, and no matter what language you speak, we all are capable of understanding the universal language of poverty. That is my TED talk. Thank you for coming. We're, we're done. The stream is over. Uh, no, I was lying. Let's keep going. Encounters that create alternative spaces for creativity and understanding. Weibel, CH4, Mao, CH5, I, I'm, I'm and Morris of... Young. Joking, but I'm also Treat these spaces as characterized by recontextualization, co-construction, <laughs> okay. and creolization, okay. as people okay. from subjugated it's backgrounds okay. find voice through an appropriation and reconfiguration of conflicting norms and values. The fact that certain places are colonized doesn't prevent social agents from constructing rhetorical and translingual spaces for renegotiating power relationships. In defining the semiotics and rhetoric of translingual literacy, there is still room to understand the multimodality of texts. Applied linguists have coined the term alignment to characterize the manner in which diverse communicative ecologies, modalities, and symbol systems are configured by multilinguals in meaning making activity. Like See Atkinson ecologies. Churchill, Nishino, and Okada, 2007. Go alignment draws attention away from grammar or language system as the locus of meaning, and points to the activity of social agents in putting together diverse semiotic Ooh. resources for meaning. Hansen, CH19, suggests the value of this approach by unveiling the strategies students, surprisingly, native speakers in this case, adopt to align different modalities and symbols to guess the meaning of multilingual websites for their research. The many studies in this volume from communicative domains such as hip hop, Malu, CH10, folk songs, Mao, CH5, 5, oh, Morris Young, CH6, Public Sorry. Signs, Mills, Milson White, CH11, Urban Interactions, Hu Ayash, CH9, Graph. Literacy as copyright, copyright to nope. introduction seven. Fiddy, Morris Not Young, today, CH6, and digital communication, Hansen, CH19, Centers Zapico, okay. CH17, have the potential for further interpretation beyond language for the way in which diverse modalities and semiotics contribute to both the production and reception of texts. While our efforts in defining translingual literacy and understanding its communicative potential will continue at the theoretical level, such an orientation also offers new directions for research. The value of this shift in orientation is that even traditional research okay. methods can be revised to yield new findings. Donahue, CH14, discusses how she revised a study she undertook from a comparative perspective on student writers from different communities with new outcomes. The translingual orientation makes her look at her research subjects from France and the United States as not compartmentalized into their different language and cultural backgrounds, but inhabiting contact zones that show the mediation and reconstruction of their texts. Since it is the compartmentalization of disciplines in modernity that led to the definition of language and literacy in monolingual, formalist, and autonomous terms, we can understand why the translingual orientation is bringing disciplines together for new research. The translingual orientation has motivated scholars to merge resources not only from different disciplines but also from different academic communities. We find that the dominance of Occidental communities in modernist knowledge construction has led to a reductive perspective on literacy and communication. The rediscovery of vibrant traditions of translingual practices outside the West and East Asian, Caribbean, African, and Mediterranean communities, with knowledge relating to them, as represented in the chapters in this volume, can help us immensely in our theorization of literacy and communication in the global contact zones. Bazerman, CH2, outlines the motivations for such merging of knowledge from diverse literacy traditions, and identifies the efforts already underway in this direction. There are also new pedagogical possibilities coming into prominence as we research a translingual orientation to literacy. 
socialization is emerging as an important means for people to learn these new literacies and develop the necessary dispositions and strategies for their negotiation in the global contact zones. Product-oriented, monolingual, and norm-based teaching can often stifle these complex dispositions and strategies students bring from outside the classroom. However, classroom and educational ethnography shows that behind the backs of their teachers, students are turning pedagogical sites as spaces for socialization, tapping into the rich communicative ecologies found therein, see Kreis and Blackledge, 2010. Learners are collaborating with their peers and mentors, and shuttling between different languages, literacies, and communities, as they develop translingual competence. Co reports on such as an experience, CH16. She shows how an international graduate student drew from the Afro dances in the graduate program and the disciplinary community for effective academic literacy development. Such a socialization orientation is also revealing that literacy is a collaborative and social enterprise. Literacy brokers and literacy sponsors. Literacy as copyright copyright 2013, 8A Suresh Kanagaraja. Play an important role in developing translingual literacy competence. No longer is literacy or communication perceived as an isolated or individual activity. Center Sapico, CH17, and Jersky, CH18, continue this line of exploration and show the roles diverse sponsors and brokers can play in the development of translingual literacy. Pedagogical implications deriving from such an orientation still need imaginative rethinking and creative design. Though teachers might feel helpless in relation to such new definitions of literacy and the need to rethink their practices, students don't feel lost. This is because, as I pointed out earlier, people are developing relevant strategies and dispositions for translingual literacies in the contact zones outside the classroom. It is possible to make the classroom a safe house for such practices and facilitate such interactions for further development of these competencies. This is exactly what Jersky, CH18, does in her institution. Going beyond the native slash non-native divide, okay. she encourages both groups to broker. So it's possible to make the classroom a safe house for such practices and facilitate in such interactions for further development of these competencies. So this is this is I think this takes us back to my idea, my my concept. I'm gonna keep harping on this because I think it's very important. The best way to learn is through play. Okay? Um and, and what play is we boil it down is a is social social interaction play is social interaction yeah the best way to learn is through social interaction and and play <laughs> you know um if you're having fun if you're enjoying what you're doing you are more likely to develop you know a positive connection to it a positive connotation to it um, you're more likely to want more of it, to get better at it. Um, if you're playing a video game that you don't like, you're going to say, to hell with this, and quit, before you even get good at it, enough to enjoy it, right? If you're playing a video game that you like, you're going to be like, it's kind of hard right now, but I'm going to stick around and get better, right? Um, so, the best way to learn is through Let's keep Broker each other's literacy products in the safe learning spaces she constructs. Similarly, Han Sun, CH19, allows her native speaker students to tap into their intuitive strategies to gather research information from multilingual sources. Pondet, CH20, devises a strategy to help students analyze literate products from a more holistic perspective, treating languages and cultures as mediating such products. It is important to emphasize that we cannot ignore the implications for form and micro-level language features in translingual literacy or pedagogy. The oh, position crap. that translingual no. literacy ah, treats place and rhetorical happening? practice as more primary shouldn't be interpreted to mean that form is irrelevant. It is simply that form is shaped for meaning in relation to these ecological, social, and contextual factors. In fact, this perspective makes us even more I'm sensitive to form than in the traditional approaches. In monolingual orientations, form could be taken for granted, as it came with ready-made meanings and values which ensured communicative success. If form doesn't hold shared meanings in the contact zone, participants have to be sensitive to co-constructing meanings. When we say in this form, regard, we, we may have to react like to traditional constructs such right? as error in our teaching. Error is what fails to gain uptake in situated interactions, not those which deviate from an abstract predefined norm. This orientation encourages a pedagogy that values students' choices and helps teachers think along with the rhetorical intentions of the students to find their meanings. There is responsibility on both sides of the production slash reception Ooh. divide here. Ooh. Just as readers have to collaborate oh in co-constructing meaning, oh. writers have to oh adopt suitable strategies to populate words with their intentions and convey those intentions appropriately. Starting Crawl the question, CH21, demonstrates the value of such a pedagogy play. in the penultimate chapter of the book. The purpose of this book is not to provide a definitive um, statement on translingual right. P. literacy. It is too early for that kind of book. Um, Besides, knowledge making doesn't work that way. 
we construct paradigms in relation to changing social conditions and new communicative realities that demand suitable alternatives. In this sense, Matsuda's chapter, CH12, on the changing currents of composition scholarship. Literacy as translingual practice, between communities and classrooms, edited by Suresh Kanagaraja, Taylor and Francis Group, 2013. ProQuest ebook central, <laughs> http colon slash no, slash ebook central dot herocaist dot com slash lib slash humboldt slash detail dot action question mark doc id equal sign copyright copyright 2013. T introduction 9. And the resulting yeah. imprecision of terminological usage needs to be understood differently. Though we do have to be careful about romanticizing new theories and constructs for the sake of academic merit, as Matsuda rightly points out, we also have to be flexible enough to change our paradigms when experiences dictate otherwise. Sometimes dominant paradigms can be discriminatory to certain communities and student groups, not to mention irrelevant to certain community experiences. Furthermore, we have to be open to traveling theories being taken up in new ways in different communities and disciplines. The way the term code switching has been taken up in composition is such an example. Though it is used in ways different from applied linguistics, it brings a special resonance that is lacking in the former field, as I argue in Kanagaraja, 2009. Okay. Compositionists have brought out the conservative and rhetorically limited ways code switching is used. By linguists. Um, Compositionists exceed power inequalities in the code switch. Those who switch codes do not need equal advanced proficiency in both languages. They can switch for performative reasons, representing subtle identities and values beyond broad social functions studied in linguistics. So, um, okay, we have the idea of code switching, right? And the, I think the standard idea of code switching is like, when I'm in class, I do not say poggers. When I am talking to my girlfriend, I do not say poggers. And when I'm in the Twitch chat, I do, right? So that's code switching. The language that I use in one place is not appropriate in quotes because who's the fuck, who the fuck's to say what's appropriate, right? But we have, you know, social conventions that tell us that certain things are not appropriate in certain places and you really have to pay attention to your grammar when you're talking in class and you really have to not be cringe when talking to your girlfriend. Um, but, um, that is conservative and rhetorically limited because the, the, the concept of, this is, this is, um, what is this called? There's a word for it. What's it called? Something politics. What is it called? Respectability politics, right? Respectability politics. Um, it's not appropriate to behave rhetorically in, it's not appropriate to behave a certain way in a certain situation. Well, it is appropriate to behave a certain way in a certain situation. And this has an aspect of racism to it, because if you're speaking in AAVE, right, and you're saying that it's not appropriate to be speaking like that in a classroom, well... That's a really weird thing to say, like, frankly, like, what? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not getting that across very clearly, I don't think, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have strife there. I'm not gonna have strife. I, it, it's weird, it's not great to restrict the language that, not, um, hmm. This is this is different from like a freedom of speech a freedom of speech kind of thing, right? Um but we are talking about the way that people use language, okay? And that does involve the types of language people use. Which you know, it it's not <laughs> it's it's not it's not um yeah, I'm I'm getting bogged down by by that. We're gonna move we're gonna move on. Um, so yeah, there could be power inequalities in the code switch. Why? Um, yeah. There is. Also, those who switch codes do not eat equal or advanced proficiency in both languages. I'm... Hmm. Not sure... It's not that I disagree with that point. It's just, I'm not sure how it connects to everything else. Um, like, we're saying that someone, the things that someone has to say still mean the same thing, still hold the same value, um, even if they are not 
perfectly proficient in a language. That's what I'm getting from that. Um, and it's not, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. But I don't, I don't, um, I don't know how that fits. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not, that's not to say that it doesn't. It's just to say that I don't know. And that's okay. Uh, they can switch for performative reasons, representing subtle identities and values beyond broad social functions studied in linguistics. So, performative reasons, um, you know, there's the, the question of authenticity. And I, I would say that is a, you know, performative, it, per, what, you know, performative is kind of like getting at maybe. Um, we are switching for performative re uh, Okay. It, it, this is going to involve a lot more than I, I think I want to get into. Let's do it. Okay, so um, gender is a performance, right? But gender is not a performance in, like, I'm wearing the male gender, let's get up on stage and do a dance, right? Gender is performative in the sense that it is an identity that is not really something inherent to us, but is something that we adopt as a way of understanding how we fit into the world. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it, that's it. <laughs> I mean, maybe some people will argue with that. That, that, that's, that's, the. That's pretty much what I, you know, understand of it, you know, gender, regarding gender. Okay, so regarding authenticity of gender, right? They can switch for performative reasons. Um, so I'm non-binary, and sometimes I feel like wearing a dress, and that doesn't really happen that much anymore. I, I've kind of moved away from, like, you know, wearing a dress <laughs> as as the time has passed. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I can wear a dress and I can kind of perform the femininity. Uh, I can, you know, embody the femininity. I can, uh, <laughs> I can um, adopt and embody a, a role a gender role that is not masculine. I like that. I like that better. Not masculine. But at the same time, I can adopt and embody a gender role that is not feminine. I like that too. I like that too. Not masculine and not feminine. I'm, I'm learning things about myself right now. Shit. We're, we, are, we are synthesizing the shit out of this paper. Just wait until we get to the next one. Oh, God, that's going to be another two hours, isn't it? I thought this was going to be fast. I thought this was going to be like, you know, 30 minutes. I might, I might have to clip the shit out of this and make it into some kind of, like, highlight reel for my professor. I am sorry. I am sorry that this is so long. Anyway, where were we? Where were we? Uh, those uh, who switch codes do not eat need equal or advanced proficiency. They can switch for performance reasons, representing subtle identities and values beyond the broad social functions studied in linguistics. I'm not going to try to nail that down. I think, I think, I think that we approximated Linguists. enough there. There could be power inequalities in the codes switched. Also, those who switch the codes do not need equal or advanced proficiency in both languages. They can switch for performative reasons, representing subtle identities and values beyond the broad social functions studied in linguistics. To capture the fascinating ways in which the meshing of codes can achieve performative meanings and voice that defies the more structured ways in which linguists perceive switching, compositionists adopt the term code meshing, see Young, 2004. Such migrations and reappropriations of theories can therefore be healthy and open up new perspectives. This tentativeness in knowledge claims in this book doesn't have to mean that teachers and students are totally helpless. What we find is that people have engaged in such forms of communication and literacy at the level of practice for quite a long time in history, with even more creative performances demonstrated. In technological developments in late modernity, it is at the level of scholarship and knowledge that we are limited. What this means is that the classroom slash community so connection, highlighted in the title of the book, can come to the rescue of teachers. By allowing community practices into the classroom, teachers can study the strategies and dispositions students have already developed elsewhere. Building on these resources rather than imposing their own understanding of literacy, teachers can also facilitate spaces for voice for students. 
However, this is not a one-way relationship of schools learning from communities. It is also important for communities and students to be mindful of the power of educational institutions. They reproduce monolingualist language ideologies and dominant norms in society and institutions. However unfair and limited they may be, these norms and ideologies have to be taken seriously. Oh shit, I put it on top Social of and educational guy. success means engaging with these norms, though this doesn't mean uncritical acceptance or conformity. As many of the chapters in this book show, the translingual practices of local communities already show such critical engagement and appropriation. Teachers can help students develop the dispositions and strategies they bring with them in more critical, really? reflective, and informed ways by engaging with the dominant norms and ideologies. Oh. As the chapters by Milson White, CH11, and Ray. Literacy as Translingual Practice, Between Communities and Classrooms, edited by Suresh Kanagaraja, Taylor and Francis Group, 2013. Hey. ProQuest eBook Central, http colon slash slash ebookcentral.pirokaist.com slash lib slash hum. Pause. Okay, so let's see. As the chapters show, minority communities are always looking up to the school to provide spaces and resources for such engagement as critical educational engagement can also lead to the pluralization of norms and the construction of more democratic social spaces. Classrooms can facilitate new community relationships. Oh. Uh, and with that, that is the end of that paper. Let's move on to the next one. I didn't choose any specific order for these because, again, I did not. Uh, there was no pre-watching that occurred here. I, I just, you know, um, well, actually, I may have pre-watched half of this. Um, let's see, we're gonna skip this. We're gonna go to the introduction. Uh, read aloud. Our institu institutions, to the extent that they address issues of learning explicitly, are largely based on the assumption that learning is an individual process, that it has a beginning and an end, that it is best separated from the rest. Remember, learning is a social practice. Right? Learning is a social practice. Learning does not happen individually. Learning happens best through play, through community, through social practice, okay? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that a lot. I'm going to say that a lot. And there's people maybe out there who are going to be like, that's not true. I learn best when I'm in my bedroom alone doing the math textbook. But then I'm going to tell you, I don't know how the fuck you learned one plus one. Yeah, I don't know how the fuck you learned one plus one if you didn't have somebody to tell you that one plus one was two at some point. That's social interaction. One plus one is two. You can't just be like, yep, this is two. I just popped out of the womb and I'm a little baby. And I said one plus one is two. How the fuck do you even know how to talk? Learning happens through social interaction. Where do we first learn language? We learn it at home when our parents tell us to go sit down and stop screaming. <laughs> I mean, maybe our, some of our parents had nicer things to say to us. Look at that fire in the background. I'm like, what is going on there? Is that furnace burning a little bit too hot? But anyway, learning, social, let's go. Rest of our activities, and that it is the result of teaching. Hence we arrange classrooms where students, free from the distractions of their participation in the outside world, can pay attention to a teacher or focus on exercises. We design computer-based training programs that walk students through individualized sessions covering reams of information and drill practice. To assess learning, we use tests with which students struggle in one-on-one -on -one combat, where knowledge must be demonstrated out of context, and where collaborating is considered cheating. As a result, much of our institutionalized... I like that one. I like that right here. Where knowledge must be demonstrated out of context. What did we just read in the last... In the last paper? The last paper said that we need to learn to understand writing and reading in context right we need to be able to understand how language is being used hi hi yep that's okay he's worried about me because i'm yelling at the screen uh but anyway we need to be able to we need to be able to understand how language to be able to better read and write we need to know how language is being used in a context the social uh, degree of language, right? So why are we demonstrating knowledge out of context when we should be demonstrating it within context? Are you doing? You want to join? I don't think this is a good time for you to join. Maybe you could join later. Institutionalized teaching and training is perceived by would-be learners as irrelevant, and most of us come out of this treatment feeling that learning is boring and arduous, and that we are not really cut out for it. 
Mm -hmm. So, what if we adopted a different perspective? One that Except, for some goddamn reason, we all learned how to use poggers on this fucking Twitch website thing. So, hmm. Place learning in the context of our lived experience of participation in the world? What if we assumed that learning is as much a part of our human nature as eating? 210 8 yen wenger. Or sleeping, that it is both life-sustaining and inevitable, and that, given a chance, we are quite good at it. Yep. And what if, in addition, we assumed that learning I'm is, not even in its essence, like a fundamental social phenomenon, like, REF electing our own deeper like, social just, nature I, I as human am, beings I am of knowing. Into this text. What kind of understanding would such a perspective yield on how learning takes place and okay, on what is required to. to support it? In this chapter, I will try to develop such a perspective. A conceptual okay, perspective, no, theory and practice. There are many different here. kinds of learning theory. Each emphasizes different aspects of learning, and each is therefore useful for different purposes. To some extent these differences in emphasis okay, are okay, EFLECT a deliberate okay. focus on a slice of the multidimensional problem of learning, and to some extent they are EFLECT more fundamental differences in oh, assumptions about the nature of knowledge, knowing, this and knowers, bullshit. and consequently about what matters in learning. For those who are interested, a number of such theories with a brief description of their focus are listed in a note at the end of this chapter. The kind of social theory of learning I propose is not a replacement for other theories of learning that address different aspects of the problem, but it does have its own set of assumptions and its own focus. Within this context, it does constitute a coherent level of analysis, it does yield a conceptual framework from which to derive a consistent set of general principles and recommendations for understanding and enabling learning ah, my it. assumptions as to what matters about learning and as to the nature of knowledge knowing and knowers can be succinctly summarized as follows i start with four premises are you we are social crazy? beings far from being trivially true this fact is a central aspect of learning Thank knowledge you. is a matter of competence with respect to valued enterprises such as singing in tune discovering scientific IC facts by seeing machines writing poetry being okay. convivial okay. growing up as a boy or a girl and so forth Knowing is a matter of participating in the pursuit of such enterprises, that is, of active engagement in the world. Meaning, our ability to experience the world and our engagement with it as meaningful, is ultimately what learning is to produce. Hey. As a REF election of these assumptions, the primary focus of this theory is on learning as social participation. Participation here refers not just to local events of engagement in certain activities with certain people, but to a more encompassing process of being active participants in the practices of social communities and constructing identities in relation to these communities. Participating in a playground clique or in a work team, for instance, is both a social theory of learning 211, a kind of action and a form of belonging. Such participation shapes not only what we do, but all. Where did it go? Learning. Identity. Oh, we can't really see the whole thing, can we? Okay, let's let's go. Learning is belonging. Community. Learning. Practice. Learning is doing. Learning. Community. Learning is belonging. Learning, identity, learning as becoming. Ooh, learning, meaning, learning as experience. Oh, 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 oh. oh that, that. I get excited by like the most ridiculous shit. Why am I like this? Um, hmm. Is it gonna do that again? Okay, no, it's fine. It looked like uh, my microphone was like big pulse and then slowly dying off. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, we're fine. We're fine. Anyway, anyway, anyway. I might need to change, turn the noise gate down a little bit. Um, but let's keep going. As a REF election of these assumptions, the primary oh, focus. Know. Learning is social participation. Participation here refers not just to local events of engagement in certain activities with certain people, but to a more encompassing process of being active participants in the practices of social communities and constructing identities in relation to these communities. Um, so... If we, we put this into terms of, like, a Twitch community, right? Who in the Twitch community makes the memes, right? Um, the people who have been there the longest, the people who know the most about the streamer, the people who know the most about the stream, the people who have, you know, seen the changes of the stream and have turned them into a narrative form through memes, right? Because if you think about it, that's what, that's what memes are doing. Memes are creating a narrative, a story about the streamer, about the community. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of examples, but I don't know if examples is necessary right now, because, you know, we've already, 
It's, it's, it's been a while. It's, we've been going for a while. Okay, guys. It's, it's been a while. Okay. So, um, constructing identities in relation to those communities. So the longer you've been in a community, the more you learn the discourse of community, the more you learn the memes of the community. And the closer you become to producing your own memes for that community. Okay? Okay. Stop that. You are so naughty. Stop, stop. Don't know if there's no treats. No treats for the cat. The cat will receive no treats. It is not time. How about this? No treats. How about no treats? No treats for the cat. Okay. Let's go. A way of talking about our changing of. Okay. So. A kind of action in a form of belonging. Such participation shapes not only what we do, but also who we are and how we interpret what we do. A social theory of learning must therefore integrate the components necessary to characterize social participation as a process of learning and of knowing. These components, shown in figure 15.1, include the following. A way of talking about our changing ability, individually and meaning, collectively, to experience our life and the world as meaningful. A way of talking about the shared historical and social resources, practice, frameworks, and perspectives that can sustain mutual engagement in action. A way of talking about the social configurations in which community, our enterprises are defined as worth pursuing and our participation is recognizable as competence. A way of talking about how learning changes who we are and creates identity, personal histories of becoming in the context of our communities. Clearly, these elements are deeply interconnected and mutually defining. In fact, looking at figure 15.1, you could switch any of the four peripheral components with learning, place it in the center as the primary focus, and the figure would still make sense. Therefore, when I use the concept of community of practice in the title of the book, I really use it as a point like of entry that? into a broader conceptual framework. Figure 15.1 components of a social theory of learning, an initial inventory. 212 8 yen wenger, of which it is a constitutive element. The analytical power of the concept lies precisely in that it integrates the components of figure 15.1 while referring to a familiar experience. Communities of practice are everywhere. Are you kidding me? We all belong to communities of practice. At home, at work, at school, in our hobbies, we belong to several communities oh of God. practice at any given time. And the communities of practice to I which we belong change over the course here. of our lives. In fact, communities of practice are everywhere. Families struggle to establish an habitable way of life. They develop their own practices, routines, rituals, artifacts, symbols, conventions, stories, and histories. Family members hate each other and they love each other, they agree and they disagree. They do what it takes to keep going. Even when families fall apart, members create ways of dealing with each other. Surviving together is an important enterprise, whether surviving consists of the search for food and shelter or of the quest for a viable identity. Workers organize their lives with their immediate colleagues and customers to get their jobs done. In doing so, they develop or preserve a sense of themselves they can live with, have some fun, and fulfill LL the requirements of their employers and clients. No matter what their OFFI jail job description may be, they create a practice to do what needs to be done. Although workers may be contractually employed by a large institution, in day-to-day -day practice they work with, and, in a sense, for, a much smaller set of people and communities. Students go to school and, as they come together to deal in their own fashion with the agenda of the imposing institution and the unsettling mysteries of youth, communities of practice sprout everywhere, in the classroom as well as on the playground, OFFI Chaley or in the cracks. And in spite of curriculum, discipline, and exhortation, the learning that is most personally transformative turns out to be the learning that involves membership in these communities of practice. In garages, bands rehearse the same songs for yet another wedding gig. In attics, ham radio enthusiasts become part of worldwide clusters of calm. Communicators. In the back rooms of churches, recovering alcoholics go to there. <laughs> Weekly meetings to find the courage to remain sober. In laboratories, scientists correspond with colleagues, near and far, in order to advance their inquiries. Across a worldwide web of computers, people congregate in virtual spaces and develop shared ways of pursuing their common interests. In OFFICES, computer users Us. count on each other to cope with the intricacies of obscure systems. In neighborhoods, youths gang together to configure their life on the street and their sense of themselves. Communities of practice are an integral part of our daily lives. They are so informal and so pervasive that they rarely come into explicit focus, but for the same reasons they are also quite familiar. Although the term may be new. A social theory of learning 213. The experience is not. Most communities of practice do not have a name and do not issue membership cards. Yet, if we care to consider our own life from that perspective for a moment, we can all construct a fairly good picture of the communities of practice we belong to now, those we belong to in the past, and those we would like to belong to in the future. We also have a fairly good idea of who belongs to our communities of practice and why, even though membership is rarely made explicit on a roster or a checklist of qualifying criteria. Furthermore, we can probably distinguish a few communities of practice in which we are core members from a larger number of communities in which we have a more peripheral kind of membership. In all these ways, the concept of community of practice is not unfamiliar. 
By exploring it more systematically, I mean only to sharpen it, to make it more useful as a thinking tool. Toward this end, its familiarity will serve me well. Articulating a familiar phenomenon is a chance to push our intuitions, to deepen and expand them, to examine and rethink them. The perspective that results is not foreign, yet it can shed new light on our world. In this sense, the concept of community of practice is neither new nor old. It has both the eye-opening character of novelty and the forgotten familiarity of obviousness, but perhaps that is the mark of our most useful insights. Rethinking learning. Next time gonna pick Placing up the focus on participation has broad implications for what it takes to understand and support learning. For individuals, it means that learning is an issue of engaging in and contributing to the practices of their communities. For communities, it means that learning is an issue of refining their practice and ensuring new generations of members. For organizations, it means that learning is an issue of sustaining the interconnected communities of practice through which an organization knows what it knows and thus becomes effective and valuable as an organization. Learning in this sense is not a separate activity. Ow. It is not something we do when we do nothing else or Ow. stop doing when we do something else. There are times in our lives when learning is intensified, when situations shake our sense of familiarity, when we are challenged beyond our ability to respond, when we wish to engage in new practices and seek to join new communities. There are also times when society explicitly places us in situations where the issue of learning becomes problematic and requires our focus. We attend classes, memorize, take okay. exams, and receive a diploma. And there are times when learning gels, an infant utters a phi RST word, we have a sudden insight when someone's remark provides a missing link, we are finally recognized as a full. 214 8 Yen Wenger. Member of a community. But situations that bring learning into focus are not necessarily those in which we learn most, or most deeply. The events of learning we can point to are perhaps more like volcanic eruptions whose fiery bursts reveal for one dramatic moment the ongoing labor of the earth. Learning is something we can assume, whether we see it or not, whether we like the way it goes or not, whether what we are learning is to repeat the past or to shake it off. Even failing to learn what is expected in a given situation usually involves learning something else instead. For many of us, the concept of learning immediately conjures up images of classrooms, training sessions, teachers, textbooks, homework, and exercises. Yet in our experience, learning is an integral part of our everyday lives. It is part of our participation in our communities and organizations. The problem is not that we do not know this, but rather that we do not have very systematic ways of talking about this familiar experience. Even though the topic of communities of practice covers mostly things that everybody knows in some ways, having a systematic vocabulary to talk about it does make a difference. An adequate vocabulary is important because the concepts we use to make sense of the world direct both our perception and our actions. We pay attention to what we expect to see, we hear what we can place in our understanding, and we act according to our worldviews. Although learning can be assumed to take place, modern societies have come to see it as a topic of concern, in all sorts of ways and for a host of different reasons. We develop national curriculums, ambitious corporate training programs, complex schooling systems. We wish to cause learning, to take charge of it, direct it, accelerate it, demand it, or even simply stop getting in the way of it. In any case, we want to do something yeah. about it. Therefore, our perspectives on learning matter, what we think about learning INF aliens is where we recognize learning, as well as what we do when we decide that we must do something about it, as individuals, as communities, and as organizations. If we proceed without our EFL acting on our fundamental assumptions about the nature of learning, we run an increasing risk that our conceptions will have misleading ramifications. In a world that is changing and becoming more complexly interconnected at an accelerating pace, concerns about learning are certainly justified. But perhaps more than learning itself, it is our conception of learning that needs urgent attention when we choose to meddle with it on the scale on which we do today. Indeed, the more we concern ourselves with any kind of design, the more profound are the effects of our discourses on the topic we want to address. The farther you aim, the more an initial error matters. As we become more ambitious in attempts to organize our lives and our environment, the implications of our perspectives, theories, and beliefs extend further. As we take more responsibility for our future on larger and larger scales, it becomes more imperative that we are EFLECT on the perspectives that inform our enterprises. A key implication of our attempts to organize learning is that we must become our EFL active with regard to our own discourses of a social theory of learning 215. Learning and to their effects on the ways we design for learning. By proposing a framework that considers learning in social terms, I hope to contribute to this urgent need for reflection and rethinking. The practicality of theory. A perspective is not a recipe, it does not tell you just what to do. Rather, it acts as a guide about what to pay attention to, what difficulties to expect, and how to approach problems. If we believe, for instance, that knowledge consists of pieces of information explicitly stored in the brain, then it makes sense to package this information in well-designed units, to assemble prospective recipients of this information in a classroom where they are perfectly still and isolated from any distraction, and to deliver this information to them as succinctly and articulately as possible. From that perspective, what has come to stand for the epitome of a learning event makes sense, a teacher lecturing a class, whether in a school, in a corporate training center, or in the back room of a library. But if we believe that information stored in explicit ways is only a small part of knowing, and that knowing involves primarily active participation in social communities, then the traditional format does not look so productive. What does look promising are inventive ways of engaging students in meaningful practices, of providing access to resources that enhance their participation, of opening their horizons so they can put 
themselves on learning trajectories they can identify with, and of involving them in actions, discussions, and REFL actions that make a difference to the communities that they value. Similarly, if we believe oh, that productive I think people in organizations. This, okay, so, um, California implemented Common Core, I think is what it's called. When I was working in an after school program, I worked with, like, you know, elementary age kids. Um, and I had no idea what Common Core was, and I don't think that a lot of teachers had an idea what Common Core was. So there was a big uproar about it as it was coming out, right? Um, and, and what Common Core is, is it's just a set of standards for how we teach things to kids. So it used to be that, like, you're teaching a kid one plus one is two. That means you're going to pull out the flashcard, and the flashcard says 1 plus 1, and the back says 2 equals 2, and you're going to show that flashcard to that kid until they start to get it, right? I mean, this is not exactly... I mean, it's kind of how I was taught math. Um, what Common Core says is that there are a lot of ways of reaching 2 um, with 1 plus 1, right? Um... So, I, I actually, let's, let's do the making 10. I love the making 10. Okay, if we have, if we're adding 9 and 1, right? We want to reach 10. So, 9 plus 1 is 10, right? What if we're adding 9 plus 1 plus 8 plus 2? We're going to make 10, right? We're going to say 9 plus 1 is 10. 8 plus 2 is 10. Okay? It's all about how do you reach the solution rather than how do you solve the problem? Um, which means that students have ways to consider problem solving in a different way than just one plus one is two, or nine plus one is 10 plus eight is 18 plus two is 20, right? That's, that's more complicated. That's harder to do in my head, even though it's still, I've still lined it up. Uh, what about nine plus eight plus one plus two? One plus two plus nine plus eight. Like, these are things that are a little bit harder to do. But if you have a different strategy, a different approach of dealing with this problem, then it, come, it becomes simpler, easier, right? So, and then the thing is, not all approaches are going to work the best for everybody. Some students are going to say, no, I actually like 1 plus 2 plus 8 plus 9 instead of 9 plus 1 and 2 plus 8. Whatever solution helps a student, or whatever system helps a student reach the correct solution, that's the right solution. So we're giving, instead of giving students one way of approaching a problem, one way of thinking about a problem, we are allowing, we're giving students a variety of things. We're just gonna throw a bunch of shit at the wall, <laughs> and whatever sticks, that's okay. Because they have figured out a way of arriving at that solution. And what that teaches students to do is not to just remember answers to solutions, but take active participation in problem solving. Um, and so this is the concept, I think we, this is the, the paper too. We're taking an active, as students, as learners, as lifetime learners, we are taking active particip participation in solving problems. And that's not, not just, um, you know, math problems, that's life problems, right? Because we're not teaching math. We are teaching how to engage. How do we engage with the world? We engage with the world in a crit from a critical perspective, from a problem-solving perspective. And these are things that you can teach to people, to little kids who are as young as like five years old. You got 10 fingers? Okay, let's see how we can add them together in different numbers. We, we have 10, let's make different uh, formulas. So we have, you know, a two, a two, and then we have eight, right? We have five, we have five. We have nine, and we have one, <laughs> right? We have different ways of thinking about the number 10 and different problems, different solutions that can be brought um, by thinking about making 10 rather than thinking about two plus eight is 10, nine plus one is 10. No, what is 10? What is a 10? Tell me right now what a 10 is. Well, it's an 8 plus a 2, or a 9 plus a 1, or a 3 plus a 7, or a 6 plus a 4. It's all those different things. 
There's also other things too, okay? We're thinking about things in creative ways, which is really fun if you think about learning, you know? Um, because what are we trying to do? We're not just trying to teach a kid, uh, we're not just trying to give a kid a fish, we're trying to teach a kid to fish, which is an old person thing to say, I know, but, but at the same time, teach that kid to fish, teach that kid to fish. Unless you're a vegan, I guess, then don't teach that kid. Teach that kid to fish for vegan fish. Um, that was a bad joke. I apologize. <laughs> we make bad jokes here, and I apologize for my bad jokes sometimes. Oh, anyway, let's continue. Organizations are the diligent implementers of organizational processes and that the key to organizational Same performance is therefore the definition oh, yeah. of increasingly more efficient and detailed processes by which people's actions are prescribed. Then it makes sense to engineer and re-engineer these processes in abstract ways and then roll them out for implementation. But if we believe that people in organizations contribute to organizational goals by participating inventively in practices that can never be fully captured by institutionalized processes, then we will minimize prescription, suspecting that too much of it discourages the very inventiveness that makes practices effective. We will have to make sure that our organizations are contexts within which the communities that develop these practices may prosper. We will have to value the work of community building and make sure that participants have access to the resources necessary to learn what they need to learn in order to take actions and make decisions that fully engage their own knowledge ability. 216 8 Yen Wenger If all this seems like common sense, then we must ask ourselves why our institutions so often seem not merely to fail to bring about these outcomes but to work against them with a relentless seal. Of course, some of the blame can justifiably be attributed to conflowists of interest, power struggles, and even human wickedness. But that is too simple an answer and unnecessarily pessimistic. We must also remember that our institutions are designs and that our designs are hostage to our understanding, perspectives, and theories. In this sense, our theories are very practical because they frame not just the ways we act, but also, and perhaps most importantly when design involves social systems, the ways we justify our actions to ourselves and to each other. In an institutional context, it is difficult to act without justifying. Okay, I'm trying to share. I'm just, I just need a moment because I'm trying to share. Um, copy the, the stream with the, the, the group chat um, for my class. I don't know if anybody's going to join, but... Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody's going to join, but it would be cool if they did, because, um, you know, I, I don't know. It, it might be fun. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Justifying your actions in the discourse of the institution. A social theory of learning is therefore not exclusively an academic enterprise. While its perspective can indeed inform our academic investigations, it is also relevant to our daily actions, our policies, and the technical, organizational, and educational systems we design. A new conceptual framework for thinking about learning is thus of value not only to theorists but to all of us, teachers, students, parents, youths, spouses, health practitioners, patients, managers, workers, policy makers, citizens, who in one way or another must take steps to foster learning, our own and that of others, in our relationships, our communities, and our organizations. In this spirit, communities of practice is written with both the theoretician and the practitioner in mind. Note. I am not claiming oh God, that a social perspective of the sort proposed here says everything there is to say about learning. It takes for granted the biological, neurophysiological, cultural, linguistic, and historical developments that have made our human experience possible. Nor do I make any sweeping claim that the assumptions that underlie my approach are incompatible with those of other theories. There is no room here to go into very much detail, but for contrast it is useful to mention the themes and pedagogical focus of some other theories in order to sketch the landscape in which this perspective is situated. Learning is a natural concern for students of neurological functions. Neurophysiological theories focus on the biological mechanisms of learning. They are informative about physiological limits and rhythms and about issues of stimulation and optimization of memory processes, Edelman 1993, Sylwester 1995. Learning has traditionally been the province of psychological theories. Theories focus on behavior modification via stimulus response behaviorist pairs and selective reinforcement. Their pedagogical focus is on control. A social theory like of learning 217. Okay. No more distraction. An adaptive response. Because they completely ignore issues of meaning, their usefulness lies in cases where addressing issues of social meaning is made impossible or is not relevant, such as automatisms, severe social okay. dysfunctionality, or animal training, Skinner 1974. Oh, Theories focus on internal cognitive structures and view learning as go. cognitive transformations in these cognitive structures. 
Their pedagogical focus is on the okay. processing and transmission ah, no, of information through communication, that? That. explanation, recombination, contrast, inference, and problem solving. They are useful for designing sequences of conceptual material that build upon existing information structures. Anderson 1983, Wenger 1987, Hutchins 1995. Okay. Is made impossible or is okay, not relevant, so such as automated. I got a little bit distracted back there. Okay, we're talking about learning history intentionally on the province of psychological theories, behaviorist theories, cognitive theories, constructive construct constructivist theories, uh, social learning. Some theories are moving away from an exclusively psychological approach, but with different with a different focus from mind. Okay. But with a different focus from mine. Theories focus on the structure of activities as historically con activities to tutted entities. Their pedagogical focus is on bridging the gap between the historical state of an activi activity and the developmental stage of a person with respect hey, to that activity. To scroll, for instance, like, uh, the gap between the what? current state of a language and a child's ability to speak that language. The purpose is to defy an EA zone of proximal development in which learners who receive help can perform an activity they would not be able to perform by themselves. Vygotsky 1934, Vertsk 1985, and Gestrom 1987. Theories focus on the acquisition of membership by newcomers' socialization within a functionalist framework where acquiring membership is defined oh, as internalizing the norms of a social group. Like Parsons, 1962. As I argue, there is a subtle difference between imitation or the internalization of norms by individuals and the construction of identities within communities of practice. Theories concern themselves both with the ways individuals organizational learn in organizational contexts and with the ways in which organizations 218 APN Wenger can be said to learn as organizations. Their pedagogical focus is on organizational systems, structures, and politics and on institutional forms of memory. Argyris and Sean 1978, Sench oh 1990, God. Brown 1991, Brown mom? and Dugwood 1991, Hawk 1995, Leonard Barton 1995, Nanaka and Takuchi 1995, Snyder 1996. Okay. What is happening References. Why are we just reading Anderson, names? Oh, because it's the end of the article. Okay, the that means we're going to move on to the last article. Uh, wait, let's go back and read the... um. Read the last one just to make sure. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, let's move on to the next one then. Um, how to cite. Oh, that's. That's. No. Um, oh, it's probably tiny. Yeah, let me make it bigger. Okay, if, as, as always, if it's reading too fast, let me know. Uh, it's, it's reading kind of slow for me, it's not all the way as fast as it can go. Uh, it's kind of making my hair fall out. I like to hear fast things. Um, but if it's too fast, we can slow it down. Um, let's read out loud. Academic li literacies is a relatively new empirical and theoretical field, one setting out to explore reading and writing in academia as social practice. Also, once again, any questions? Any questions? Any questions at all? There are no bad questions. Uh, and the best, you know, uh, the... You give me a question and I can give you an answer and that that's always fun and sexy and cool. Um, Social practice, using ethnographically oriented methodologies and drawing on a range of critical theories. The pluralization of literacy signals an interest in academic reading and writing not only as diverse and situated in specific disciplinary contexts, but also as ideologically shaped, reflecting institutional structures and relations of power. This ideological concern gives rise to a transformative agenda encompassing individual writers, the conventions, and practices of the academy, and the wider social relations in which all are embedded. Academic literacies combines an empirical interest in the relationship between linguistic slash rhetorical conventions and knowledge making practices in academia as currently configured, with a critically driven vision of how these could be different, though this will always be contested, more richly varied and more equitable. Oh, in many ways, academic literacies remains My on the margins of academic writing theory and pedagogy, but has contributed dynamism to a number of research domains concerned with academic writing, including EAP. Cool. This chapter aims to provide ah. a broad overview of the field, pointing to key empirical and theoretical this. landmarks. The chapter also focuses specifically on the interface between academic literacies and EAP, in keeping with the particular concerns of this volume. A key aim is to explore connections and divergences with particular traditions within EAP, and in particular to articulate some of the fruitful connections between academic literacies, henceforward AC lits, and work in the domain known as critical EAP. We begin by offering a historical account of the emergence and development of this field, followed by a consideration of some of the key themes raised by scholars in foundational, as one the term's origin as a descriptive, well as in more recent, contributions. We then briefly review a key area of current debate, the relationship of AC Lit's informed critique to practice. The following what? section focuses on research methodology in AC Lit's, outlining its over- The relationship of AC Lit's, what the heck is that? Critique to practice. 
following section focuses on the research methodology in AC Lit, outlining its overarching ethnographic orientation. The final two sections explicitly focus on key divergences and connections between AC Lit and work within EAP, pointing to the generative questions raised by both. Okay. Okay. It, what is this? Okay, here, academic literacies. Okay, okay, okay. Damn. Um, and what is EAP? Including EAP. Including EAP. EAP. Academic literacies. I don't know what you. Oh, literacies remains the mar on the margins of academic writing theory and pedagogy, but has contributed to. Contributed dynamism. I cannot talk right now. Contributed dynamism. 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 There we go. Sometimes we just, you know, sometimes you just gotta clap. Um, drop my first friends. Anyway, uh, to a number of research domains concerned with academic writing, including EAP. I feel like I should know what that is, but I don't. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, what it means to do... Uh, okay, so we conclude by calling for a greater... For greater dialogue between... Oh, hi! New follower! Joyzy, Joyzy man. Howdy, how you doing? Welcome to the stream. Thanks for following. Um... Are you who you think I are? What the fuck did I just say? Are you who I think you are? I don't know. Um, but, it, yeah. So we're, 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 I'm not actually, I'm not actually going to read it the whole time. Eventually I'm going to, like, stop sc scrolling around and, like, let it read itself. But right now, I am pausing for clarification. So, uh... So, yeah, where, where were we? We conclude by calling for greater dialogue between AC Lit and critical EAP in order to, to develop rich understandings of what it means to do academic knowledge making in the contemporary world. Okay. That's a big order. Um... No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do a deep dive into that because historical I'm perspectives. That's gonna happen. Okay, let's Academic let it go. literacies emerged in the 1990s in is, the UK oh, and in here. South Africa. Warning: This game is kind of gross, but it's fun. We're, we're we are a janitor and we are in space and we are cleaning up dead people. So, Africa in national contexts where the higher education systems were undergoing profound change. In the UK, the policy context oh, yeah. was Feel one of higher to, education to expansion, comments, widening participation and to and increasing diversity of the student that. population. The initial Ask concern question. was not primarily international students or multilingualism, a key focus of attention in EAP, but there. local students, whether monolingual or multilingual, whose increasing presence in higher education threw into relief taken for granted academic literacy practices oh. and problematized the idea that academic literacy uh. in a particular language, oh, assumed to be English, was relatively straightforward to teach and learn and, once learned, was transferable from one context to another, Ivanic and Lee, 2006, oh. Lee and Street, 1998, Lillis, 2000. Okay, um, I'm Increasing presence in higher education threw into relief taken for granted academic literacy practices problematized the idea that academic literacy in a particular language, assumed to be English, was relatively straightforward to teach and learn, and once learned was transferable from one context to the other. So this is what we're talk this is what the other paper was talking about. The um social theory of learning paper was talking about um grammars versus something let's find it let's find it oh god it's <laughs> we're not gonna be able to find it oh hell no Let, let's try anyway um curriculum uh organization no no it's way it's way before this isn't it um most communities have like way at the beginning no way maybe it is did i really oh my god i spent so much time on this paper <laughs> ridiculous um let's see uh we, here we go 
go, here we go, here we go. Okay, uh, we design computer-based training, training programs. Uh, our institutions largely based on the assumption that learning is an individual process. That's not exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking... Oh, I went too far back. Suppose we both adopted a different perspective. I'm gonna... Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be annoyed with you. Okay, you, why are you doing this to me? My cat is being a brat. Okay, speed on. No idea. We won't know what the tree jar is now. Okay, where were we? Um... Uh... Uh, I'm trying to find it, but it's like it's hard. I'm also maybe it was in the other one. Was it in this paper? What is it in this paper? Maybe it, maybe it what? Not. Yeah, it was definitely in this paper. Like, there's this line about um, teaching grammar, uh, rhetoric is, uh, uh, socialized and curriculum. Meaning, okay, here we go. Uh, meaning is guaranteed by the uniform, uniform codes and conventions a homogenous community shares when we move beyond um, practices, therefore, have an important place. This is not it either. It. Um, habitus, I remember the habitus. Uh, I can't find it. Um, but basically, um, there's grammars and there's context. So, um... Yeah, relatively straightforward to teach and learn. So, grammar, um, def dictionary definitions. We teach you the dictionary definition. Now you know how to use the word. But not really, because um, uh, the, the, it's the consequences analogy, okay? Do you want rewards for completing that job, or do you want consequences for completing that job? You would rather have consequences. Would you rather have consequences? No, you would rather have rewards for treating that job, because consequences is not just the... Um, something caused something else, right? Something that was caused by something else. It's also the associations that you have with that term, the social practices that you have with that term, where your parents said, there will be consequences for this F grade on your report card. Um, you know what I'm saying? Okay, anyway, so we can't just teach someone the defini dictionary definition of consequences. We can't just relatively straightforwardly teach someone the di dictionary definition of consequences. We need to teach them the, the context in which consequences can be applied, which is, you know, bad things, bad things, bad things. Let's keep going. 2001, 2014. Now that I, like, I can't in South find Africa, the thing that I'm interest for, in I'm writing like, really, and reading like, practice at university I mean, emerged in the national context of post apartheid okay, expansion of higher education where concerns with access, diversity, power, and equality were central to a political agenda of social transformation. Angelo Carter, 1998, Thiessen and Cooper, 2014, oh Thiessen and Pletson, 2006. In both these national contexts, researchers began to focus on academic writing, principally because of the high stakes of writing for assessment, but also as a response to deficit discourses in wide circulation, in national media, as well as educational circles, which focused on students' inability to write, in English, for discussions of deficit, see poor. Two widening participation is the umbrella term used for a raft of progressive policies set in motion in the 1990s in the UK, increasing the undergraduate population and opening up university admissions for students from underrepresented social groups. Ah, Example ah, Lee, 1994, ah. Lillis and Turner, 2001, Thiessen and Van Plazen, 2006. A.C. Litt's research was driven to a large extent by the concerns of practitioners, those with a role in teaching, learning and language development in higher education, who recognized the inadequacy of such deficit approaches. 
It was also becoming clear that default teaching and learning practices, such as lecture monologues or the ubiquitous essay, were no longer fit for purpose in relation to a diverse student body whose acculturation into academic literacies could not be assumed on entry to university, and that business as usual would in any case be ideologically unacceptable in an expanded he sector premised upon openness and diversity as explicit political goals, for overviews of these debates see. Lillis, 2001, Mann, 2008. A key strand of this questioning of familiar he pedagogies was a challenge to individualist, psychologist approaches to learning and to normative assumptions about academic writing, both of which, it was argued, fostered unhelpful deficit perceptions of students and, of particular concern to academic literacy's researchers, their language and literacy practices, Haggis, 2003, Lee and Street, 1998, echoing arguments made by adult educators, e.g., Gardner, 1992. Drawing on anthropologically based new literacy studies, NLS, more, Barton et al., 2000, Bainham and Prince Lou, 2001, G, 1996, A.C. Litz researchers reframed the student writing problem, turning the gaze on academic institutions, universities, disciplines, vocalists through the experiences and perspectives gazed, of student like, writers, Ivanek, 1998, Lee, no, 1994, it, Lee and Street, I'm 1998, so, okay. Lillis, 2001. Streets, 1984, notion of autonomous versus ideological models of literacy was, and is, key to the AC Litz conceptual apparatus. Autonomous framings of literacy conceptualize it as separate slash separable from context, as a fixed set of skills autonomous or competencies which, which can, can be- Shush! Hush you. Okay. Autonomous versus ideological models of literacy was, and is, key to the AC Litz conceptual apparatus. So, autom autonomous framings of literacy conceptualize it as separate, separable from context, as a fixed set of skills or competencies which can be processed or possessed, possessed or lacked, leading to destructive binary perceptions of learners as literate, illiterate, and to remedial, bolt on writing pedagogy. Ooh, 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 ooh. But at the same time, right, uh, we know that anybody can learn the contextually appropriate uses of poggers. So why would that not be the same for English? Hmm. 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 Ooh. 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 Can be possessed or lacked, uh, leading to destructive yeah. binary perceptions of learners as literate slash illiterate and to remedial, both on writing pedagogies. Street, Lee, and others recognized that the essayist literacy which dominated, and still dominates, the academy was just such an autonomous model. See Lillis 2001. Um, so I think what we're talking about here is discourses, right? So, um, the essayist, essayist literacy. Essayist literacy is writing an essay. And if you know how to write an essay, right, you're, you're following a specific formula. You are, I mean, not, maybe not necessarily a f f formula, but you know, you are following a set of rules that are the academic essay rules, right? So that is a, a form of literacy, that is a form of discourse, and then there's also, you know, discourses within the discourse because there's like particular types of essays. You don't just write an, an essay and it's an essay across the board. We're getting a little bit bogged down into the meat of things, but let, you know, let's keep going, let's keep going, okay? Um, you don't just write an essay for English, right? There are many different discourses that you might write an essay for, right? So the essayist literacy um, is just one form of a very particular discourse. Um, so it's not, it's not, um, it's not separable from context, right? The literary essay, the essayist literacy, the literary essay that you learn to write in English is not really going to be useful writing in um, biology <laughs> because these are different discourses. You are learning a particular discourse and you're trying to apply it generally. But the thing is, you don't really apply discourses generally. You apply discourses to the places where they belong. Um, and and we don't want to mistake this for um, we don't we don't really want to get like too hard lined into this because once again we do have the the issue of you know bilingual translingual right where people do speak in different languages and English is. A language of many languages 
And so there is the, the multilingual element um, to it. I just sit the fuck still. Okay, I'm trying to, to do a thought here. And I just lost a thought, and it's your fault. You are such a cat, okay? Um, but yeah, if, if here, the basic idea is if you learn to write an essay in English, and then you write that same essay in biology, and the, the professor is mad because you wrote the wrong essay, it's because it's a different discourse, and it's a different, you're basically speaking, you know, French to a person who has only ever understood English. Okay? It's, it's you know, very... Yeah, it's not as simple as all that either, but you know, it's it's if we boil it down to its basic parts, I think. Um, I think that that's an approximation that we can make. Streets, nineteen eighty four. Okay. Notion of autonomous versus ideological models of literacy was and to is the, key to the, the AC actual... Lit's conceptual apparatus. Autonomous exactly. framings of literacy conceptualize it as separate slash separable from context, as a oh fixed set of skills or competencies which oh can wait. be possessed or lacked, leading to destructive binary perceptions of learners as literate slash illiterate and to remedial, both on writing pedagogies. Street, Lee, and others recognized that the essayist literacy which dominated, and still dominates, the Are academy was just me? such an autonomous model, see Lillis 2001, oh, Lillis and Turner, 2001. The theorization of reading and writing in the academy is no less contingent and contested than any other set of literacy barrel. practices, in spite of ideological denial, led to the development of Lee and Streets, 1998, now widely disseminated three-part heuristic or three here. models of academic writing, framed as 1. Decontextualized skills 2. More or less implicit academic socialization into given genres and practices 3. Situated, shifting, and contested literacies an important aspect of this tripartite model, not always taken up in subsequent debates, is that each tier successively encapsulates the other, Lee and Street, 1998, 158-9. In research terms, this means that attention to academic writing as literacies does not exclude questions generated by the other two That's conceptual levels but seeks a more encompassing understanding of the nature of student writing within institutional practices, power relations, and identities, Ibid, 158-9. Okay, so not that the same against time as Lee and Street's much, work, Ivanik. 1998, was using NLS-derived methodologies to generate insights into students' right. experiences uh, of academic writing, yeah. particularly in relation to issues of identity. Bastard. Ivanik's 1998 study combined textual analysis drawing on critical discourse oh. analysis, CDA, e.g. Fairclough, 1995, with insider accounts of text production, demonstrating how ethnographic data could enrich Get understandings it? of what it means to do academic writing. Viewing academic writing through a social practice slash student writer lens exposed a damaging gap in understanding between what? tutors and students, Ivanic 1998, Lee and Street 1998, Lillis 2001, and through life on students' struggles as Wait, they tried to blood? negotiate a pathway that's through blood. the maze of tacit and sometimes contradictory there expectations. The use of CDA enabled a critical analysis of institutional language, for example, Lee and Street discussing the language of feedback, noted tutors' use of categorical modality, using imperatives and assertions <laughs> with little mitigation or qualification. They argue that such feedback comments enact tutors' right to criticize, oh and as such are a marker of their power and oh authority yeah. over students, 1998, okay. 169. This aspect of the work made an important contribution to scholarship in the field of e-assessment and feedback, see also Ivanic et al., 2000. Links were also made with the much longer tradition of writing pedagogy slash research in the United States, including composition studies, e.g. in Ivanic 1998, which had begun to tackle questions of academic literacy and higher education access several decades earlier. By drawing on these different traditions, pedagogical, anthropological, and critical linguistic, AC Lit's researchers were able to explore the rewards, risks, and losses for academic writers, not only in terms of academic success but also of meaning and identity, e.g. Angelo Carter, 1998, Lillis, 2001. Insights derived from ethnographic studies were sharpened through a parallel emerging interest in the epistemological complexity of academic discourse, and through work subjecting dominant academic rhetorical traditions to critical scrutiny, Kendlin and Highland. 1999, Jones, Turner, and Street, 1999, again influenced in part by work in the us-based fields of writing in the disciplines, e.g. Like e. Benzerman, 1988, and writing across the curriculum, e.g. Russell, 1991. Key themes in academic literacies research. Here. A number of overlapping themes emerged from AC Lit's research activity which have continued to be developed. Students often experience the demands placed on them as writers as opaque and obscure. This critique is captured by Lillis' concept of Stop. the institutional practice of mystery, 2001, 
58. A notion found useful by some EAP researchers and practitioners e.g. Harwood and Hadley, 2004, developed in the context of her longitudinal ethnographic study of 10 undergraduate writers from non-traditional backgrounds. A.C. Litt's research provides an empirical basis for recasting difficulties in academic writing as an institutional issue rather than one of individual failure and has included work on trainee he teachers, Steerer, 2008, undergraduates at prestigious institutions, Boss, 2009, and of academics themselves, Gourlay, 2011, Lee and Steerer, 2011, Lillis and Curry, 2010. <coughs> A.C. Litt's work has been taken up more widely in critical approaches to higher education pedagogy e.g. Haggis, 2003, Mann, 2008. Disciplinary discourses are historically situated and contested, Abel. The challenges for students studying within more than one discipline are well documented by Lee and Street, oh, wait, 1998, 1999, showing that demands vary within the discipline, even from one okay. tutor to another, that area finding supported in other studies, now. Bainham, 2000, Ivanik, 1998, Reed ETAL, 2001. Other research throws light on new hybrid academic writing genres, associated in particular with vocational degree courses, and the confusion, amongst students and tutors, which often surrounds discourses and genres, Bainham 2000, Cream, 2000, Lee, 2012, Lillis and Rye, 2011, Steerer, 2008. These empirical findings challenge unitary notions of I academic writing, exploding washer. the mix of transferability, that writing is a discrete, portable package of competencies, and of transience that the student writing problem is caused by a temporary influx of underprepared or disadvantaged students, and can be bracketed for ah. remedial action, until such students get up to speed, or things return to normal, decent and banned flexing, um, 2006. Oh my god. Uh, Identity is a significant dimension in academic hold on, writing. Hold on, hold on, Work hold by Ivanic, 1990. Shush. 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 Okay. Um, underprepared or disadvantaged students that can be bracketed for remedial action until such students get up to speed or things return to normal. Okay. Um, so, there was a story I read about a study, and basically, um, they were studying pre, pre-K, uh, maybe it was, maybe it was on the majority report, I don't remember, but it was basically free pre-K, um, programs, um, preschool, pre-K, whatever the heck it's called, um, as compared to private pre-K and preschool programs, and the results, because we know that, you know, early, early childhood education is very, very important for getting a child prepared to start school. Um, I mean, let's not even get into why school, like, why expecting, like, a five-year-old to sit down for a bunch of hours a day and learn math, you know, do flashcards and alphabet things, you know, um, is, is not the greatest way of teaching them. Um, but, you know, pre-K itself, the structure of pre-K, the, the free programs for low-income students who are, you know, by, um, default considered remedial, um, because of their dif disadvantaged status, um, you know, lower income, of course, um, these students were, um, Okay, so I worked in an after-school program, and we had certain things that we had to do during the day, right? Um, you had homework time, where you had to sit the kid down for an hour and make them do homework, even if they didn't have homework. <laughs> this was a, a free and low-cost, low-income program, right? So you're sitting the kid down. They've already been to school for, like, how God knows how many fucking hours sitting and doing work. And now they have to come to the after school program and all they want to do is run around in circles and just be a kid for a few hours. And you're like, nope, we have to sit down and do homework, right? This is a very punitive thing to have kids do. Um, especially when it comes to, you know, these are low income kids who are going to an after school program and the after school program has to be educational, right? Well, the... While the, the, you know, slightly less disadvantaged kids who have, you know, parents who have enough money to send them to, like, daycare get to, like, go braid each other's hairs and make daisy chains and shit, right? Um, and remember what I said. Remember what I said. Learning happens best through play. So, all of this as a preface to results from pre-K, from lower income, disadvantaged programs that 
emphasize academics and education over play and having fun by the time i think it was they they reached like second grade or third grade or somewhere between the second grade and fifth grade i'm not exactly sure um but by the time they had reached that benchmark you know a few year benchmark all of the advantages that those kids the low income kids had gotten from pre-k were it was gone now why was it gone <laughs> because and I mean, maybe there's, you know, more, you know, the kid is still from a lower income disadvantaged home, you know, all of these different things. But um, from my understanding, um, it is the punitive nature of these programs, the punitive nature of education um, that is about pushing a child to learn to do a thing rather than allowing, uh, creating within them a joy and a love for knowledge and learning in the social recreational capacity. Remember, learning through play, okay? So we find in these programs that the benefits that were gained from them are lost within a few years because it's actually not that great to sit a kid down, especially a little teeny tiny kid, and make them learn things. Who would have thunk? Um, my cat with the door is standing behind me, staring at me disapprovingly, but he's gone. Anyway, okay. So yeah. Um, underprepared or disadvantaged students are bracketed for remedial and can be... Um, uh, writing is a discrete portable package of competencies and of transience. That the student writing problem is caused by a temporary influx of underprepared or disadvantaged students and can be bracketed for remedial action until stu do such students get up to speed or things return to normal. Yeah. Yeah. Um. There are, there are no underprepared and disadvantaged students, I think. They're only underprepared and uh, ill-equipped teachers. I mean, that's not to say that there are not lower-income students, you know, but I don't think that... I think the disadvantage comes from having a teacher who is not willing to teach the way you need to learn. That's where the disadvantage comes from. And we often put the onus on the child who is not learning rather than the teacher who isn't teaching the way the child needs to learn. Um, and yeah, this is all about uh, grammars versus contexts. Are you teaching grammars or are you teaching contexts? Are you teaching rules or are, are, you, teaching, are you teaching through rules or are you teaching through play? Like, imagine if you had a, a, a remedial Twitch chat class where you learned how to, like, talk in the Twitch chat, and you had to, like, write poggers on the blackboard 500 times. <laughs> That's so stupid. Oh my god, I feel so bad for my professor right now. I just, I'm sorry. Sorry. And right, 2011, Steerer, okay. tooth identity is a significant dimension in academic writing. Work by Ivanik, 1998, Lee, 1998, Lillis, 2001, and Thiessen, 2001, among others, highlights the identity-related consequences for students and scholars who bring other experiences and discourses, those less valued in the academy as currently configured, with them to their studies. Drawing on critical and post-structuralist work on discourse and subjectivity, such work makes explicit the ways in which language is closely bound up with not only possibilities for meaning-making, but for possibilities for being in the world. These and later studies, e.g. Boss, 2009, see identity slash IES not only as a function oh of individual biography and circumstance, Again, but as a political question closely connected with the distribution of cultural capital and the differential value attributed to different meaning-making resources, in terms of discourses, languages, and language. Varieties, e.g. Thiessen and Cooper, 2014, Thiessen and Van Pletsen, 2000... I'm shushing her. Um, this is, if you're interested in knowing who she is, her name is Zira. She's Microsoft Zira. And I used to be attached to uh, Microsoft, um, I forget who, I forget who she was, but there was another Microsoft. 
And now I, I like Microsoft Zero because it's a little bit easier on the ears. I feel like she reads a tiny bit faster, too. Okay, um, so anyway, drawing on critical and post-structuralist post work on discourse and subjectivity. Um, so discourse is, remember, there's many different discourses. Poggers is a discourse. Emotes are a discourse. Um, memes are a discourse. And then subjectivity. Um, subjectivity is um, what we were talking about, about gender, right? Um, gender is identity. Gender is a performance. Not really, there's not really a performance, but it's, you know, it's, it's performative. It is, you know, um, I wake up today and I decide to, you know, embody gender. I forget what I said. I said, like, something really good, and I just, I need to, like, clip that and just, like, hold on to that, because I, I feel like I explained that really well. Just go back to the time when I said that and remember that like that. So drawing on, uh, on discourse and subjectivity, it's, um, think about, think less, okay, think less about, um, when we're thinking about subjectivity, I think it helps to think a little bit less about what you are subjected to and more about what you subject yourself to. I think that's the easiest way to explain it. And maybe it's, it's going to lack a little bit of nuance. Maybe it's going to lack a lot of bit of nuance. But I think subjectivity is, is, is maybe, you know, if we're going for like the simplest definition, it's what you subject yourself to. Um, so such work makes explicit the ways in which language is closely bound up with not only possibilities for meaning making, but for possibilities of being in the world. So remember, subjectivity, what you subject yourself to, possibilities of being in the world, the identity that you occupy, whether it's your gender, whether it's your race, whether it's your sexuality, whether it's your um, membership in a niche online community that posts little pictures of frogs <laughs> in reaction to certain scenarios in, in video games, right? We are involved in discursive communities that make meaning through the, the identities um, and, and language is very bound up with this. Um, you know, back to the poggers anal analogy. I'm not going to say poggers. I mean, I would. I would. I say poggers everywhere, goddammit. But, you know, people on Twitter, for the most part, are like, I'm not going to say poggers to my girlfriend. I love that. I hate it, but I love it at the same time. But anyway, they're like, you know, I'm not going to say poggers to my girlfriend. Why? Because talking to my girlfriend is not the appropriate discourse for the term poggers. <laughs> um, but yeah. Possibilities of being in the world. I cannot be a person who says poggers to my girlfriend. I can, but you can't. You could, but you won't. Because you subject yourself to the identity that doesn't allow you to do that. Am I wrong? Am I am I wrong? Am I wrong? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, these later studies see identities not as a function of I I I I did not say function correctly. Okay. These conjunction junction. What's your function? Anyway. <clears throat> these and later studies see identities not only as a function of individual biography and circumstance. Biography, identity, circumstance. You know, where you are and who you are, what you're doing. But as a political question closely connected with the distribution of cultural capital. Ooh, cultural capital. Cultural pa uh, capital, um, who is the, the dominant, what is the dominant discourse? Who is driving the dominant discourse? Who is seen as capable of per participating in the discourse and not per capable of participating in the discourse? Um, if you see somebody, 
um, if you're on Twitter, right, and you see a certain tweet, and you look at the person who wrote the tweet, and you think to yourself, is that the right person to make that tweet? Cultural capital. And the differential value, it's not, it's not exactly, it's not exactly, it's a little shorthand. We're, we're looking for um, uh, general associations rather than fine paint. We're painting with broad strokes, painting with broad strokes. Um, the, and the differential value attributed to different meaning making resources. Um, ooh. So the value of Google versus scholarly, scholarly sources. Um, excuse me, but do you have a source for, I saw this today, do you have a source for that tweet? Is it a scholarly source? Did you scholarly source your tweet? People on Twitter are insufferable nerds. I, if you're not, if, like, it, it's, it's, it's kind of wonderful, but it's also kind of hell. Is the people on Twitter are like insufferable nerds who think they're really cool. And I, I very much identify as an insufferable nerd, but I also think that I'm really cool. So it's like seeing a bunch of me. A bunch of me. It's just like seeing a bunch of me on Twitter. And it's, it's really, it's a surreal experience. Except I like to think that I'm kind of self-aware. I don't know. Anyway. Um... In terms of discourses, language, and language varieties. So, there is um, a need to open up the ac academy to a broader range. I'm going to read this in my Skyrim voice. There is a need to open up the academy to a broader range of semiotic linguistic practices as valid funds of knowledge. Despite the de facto diversity and hybridity of academic discourse referred to above, A.C. Litt's researchers have argued that the entrenched privileging of essayist literacy perpetuates inequality in the academy, closing down diversity and knowledge-making, working against policy goals of widening access. I don't know why I'm reading it like that when you're like, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I'm actually not writing an essay. I'm not, I'm not doing an essay as literacy. I'm, I'm doing this thing. Um, some, let's see, let's, let's keep going. Privileging of essays literacy perpetuates inequalities in the academy, closing down diversity in knowledge making, working against oh, policy goals of widening access. Some studies throw light on the role of evaluation and assessment by gatekeepers in maintaining these conventions and regulating access to particular academic inner circles e.g. Lillis and Curry, 2010. Others focus on students out of college literacies as a basis for exploring ways in which gaps between home and college literacies can be bridged through changed institutional practices and pedagogies, Ivanik et al., 2009, Lee and Jones, 2010, Paxton, 2007. A.C. Litz thus specifically addresses diversification of the kinds of semiotic resources that could be used for academic meaning-making, exploring ways in which the academy can open up to new genres and practices, e.g. Archer, 2006, Cream, 2000, Curry, 2007, English, 2011, Lillis, 2011, Thiessen, 2001, as a means towards institutional equity but also towards the enrichment of academic knowledge-making. The internationalization of the academy has meant that academic literacy's research has increasingly followed the South African example in turning its attention to the importance of adopting multilingual approaches to academic knowledge production, with some researchers focusing on more advanced academic writers such as research students, and scholars writing for publication, Lillis and Curry, 2010. There is a need to analyze practices in contemporary academia and the professions more generally. In keeping with its stance of openness to diversity and change, increasingly researchers in AC Litz have extended their research foci. One key logical extension has been, in terms of writers, what broadening David beyond the focus on learners to include everyday David professional what? literacy practices. Hold on! They've increased their research post time. What? It's a word that I am not aware of. Uh-oh. What is it? There. Uh, center or interest of activity. The focus. Oh, so focus and then foci. Okay, okay. It's just it's just multiple focusing. We're, foc we're focusing multi in a multiplicitous 
manner. I don't think I just said a word. I don't such as research students and scholars writing for publication. Lillis and Curry, okay. 2010. Okay. Do we have to there is a need to analyze practices again. in contemporary academia and the professions more generally. In keeping with its stance of openness to diversity and change, increasingly researchers in AC Lits have extended their research foci. One key logical extension has been. In terms of writers, broadening beyond a focus on learners to include everyday professional literacy practices e.g. social workers, Lillis and Rye, 2011, and academics, Lee and Steerer, 2011, as well as academics seeking publication, Lillis and Curry, 2010. Another key extension has been the increasing attention paid by academic literacies informed researchers to new and proliferating text production practices in a digital age of academia, Coleman, 2010, Goodfellow and Lee, 2007, 2013, Lee and Jones, 2010, McKenna and McAfee Nia, 2011, as part of thinking what is meant okay, by writing and- Hold on, hold on. Increasing intention, attention paid by academic literacies informed academic literacies informed research to new and pro proliferating text production practices in a digital age of academia um so this is this is this is my this is what i'm this is my this is my jam That that is, you know, that that's kind of my project. Kind of my project. Society, Lillis, two thousand and thirteen. An issue of ongoing concern: the relationship okay, between critique and practice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna exit out of the. Okay. Zero. Okay, we're about halfway society, through this. Society, society, Lillis, two thousand and thirteen. We're about halfway. An issue through. of ongoing concern: the relationship between critique and so. practice. The critical orientation of AC Lit, as in the case of critical EAP, discussed below, has caused questions to be raised about its usefulness for teachers working in mainstream contexts, e.g. Wingate and Tribble, 2012. AC Lit's researchers have always acknowledged the need for a multi-layered approach which incorporates attention to issues more closely aligned with models 1 and 2 of Lee and Street's heuristic, 1998, see above, such as the need to raise students' awareness of valued academic genres and to support them to present polished work which does not draw attention to itself through errors. The need to find ways of drawing on academic literacy's critique to build pedagogy is emphasized in Lillis, 2003-2011, where, drawing on Bacton, she proposes and illustrates a writing pedagogy aimed dialogic rather than dialectic meaning making. Lee, 2004, and Paxton and Frith, 2014, focus on the implications of AC Lit's critique for curriculum design. What AC Lit seeks to explicitly avoid is the idea that students first need to learn the basics and only then can be exposed to a pedagogy which leaves space for questioning and change. Questioning, for students and teachers, can be seen as a distraction from getting down to the real business of learning to master academic discourses, with the yeah. danger that questioning is infinitely postponed, really? or reserved only for those already admitted to academic inner circles, and that the identities, knowledge, and this senior what I'm resources talking about. student right we're, we're learning to write an essay, because first you need to learn how to write the essay, right? But then you get to the biology class and you realize, oh shit, it's not that kind of essay. So instead of learning, we are learning a form, and that form is not necessarily as fluid as we would think it is. Okay. Writers bring from outside the academy are gradually left behind, nope. to the detriment of all. Thus criticality is key to any pragmatism centered on writers' desires for meaning making as well as on academic success. Nevertheless, it is important to acknowledge that it may be easier to implement dialogic and critical pedagogies in higher education spaces where the constraints are not so huge, for example at postgraduate level or in particularly privileged institutional contexts, Tuck, okay, 2013. I, I, the question I of what AC Lit scholarship really has to offer with regard to. Developing We're transformative practice is one taken seriously as illustrated in work by Lee 2004, Lillis 2003, 2011, Street and Loom, 2009, and Street, http colon slash slash teaching eap dot wordpress dot com slash 2013 slash 04 slash 24 slash blog post hyphen by hyphen Brian hyphen Street hyphen academic hyphen literacies. A recent example of the explicit attempt to define and illustrate what it means to adopt or work with AC Lits for pedagogy or course design is the forthcoming Working with Academic Literacies collection, where teacher researchers provide case studies of pedagogic interventions at undergraduate and postgraduate levels in across disciplinary contexts, Lillis et al. eds, forthcoming. Case studies from across disciplinary boundaries in 10 different countries illustrate how teacher researchers are seeking to transform pedagogies of academic writing and reading, to transform the kinds of resources, genres, and semiotic practices that are used slash able in academia and to transform the ways in which institutions conceptualize what it means to 
engage successfully in academic literacy practices and to develop provision which meets their policy goals of inclusivity and diversity. Main research methods. A social practice perspective entails a view of writing as inseparable from context, hence the need for ethnographic methodologies which facilitate analysis of texts as part of contexts. Thus, as well as analyzing samples of academic writing, in draft and as finished products, AC Lit's researchers may, for example, elicit writer views, and slash or literacy histories, often through interviews centered around particular texts gather textual, field note, photographic and interview data which throw light on institutional contexts and slash or writer's interests conduct participant observation of literacy events as a lens onto practice. One core generative tension of ethnography is the dynamic between insider, emic, perspectives, usually of writers themselves, and the outsider, etic, perspective of the researcher analyst. The desire to move beyond text, to seek understandings of writing which cannot be derived solely from the expert or etic analysis of text, was a key driver in the work of some early researchers etic. in the field who were conscious etic. of the limitations of formal linguistic etic. analysis alone. Ivanic, 1998. Is that it? Is that? No, no, it's not. She. One core generative tension. It's not a she, I don't know. Her. Etic. Get up. Just etic analysis. The etic definition in anthropology is an approach to studying a culture from the outside of the culture. Indeed, instead focusing on observing the culture. What? Approach to studying a culture from the outside of the culture, instead focusing on observing the culture. The etic perspective definition is the perspective of an outsider looking at another culture without taking part of it, relying on observation instead of participation. See? Okay, this, 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 um... This is why I made the Twitch, why I'm doing the whole Twitch thing, is because I don't want an outside, per, an outside, you know, perspective. I want the inside. I want an insider. So an emic perspective? Hmm. I don't know. Let's check it out. Let's check out emic. Topics. Process. See? Relating to or denoting an approach, of, an approach to the study or, or description of a particular language or culture in terms of its internal elements and their functioning rather than in terms of any existing external framework. Okay. So then we have um, a little bit... Okay. So internal elements versus external elements. Okay, that's interesting. Insider perspectives. An outsider perspective. Okay. Um, of ethno ethnography. Ethnography. Ethnography is the study. Place to go. <laughs> um, scientific description of the customs of individual people and cultures. Okay, so it's like studying people. We're studying people. So, um, um, there was a big. Uh. Anthropology has a very cursed past um, of, of, of people going to places and observing things and not really understanding what they're observing and coming back with shitty ideas. So we are, it's, um, if you're, uh, the, the, the concept of, like, colonizing knowledge, right? Colonizing, yes, that's, that's basically what we're talking about here. And so the tension is, is the dynamic between the insider perspective and the outsider perspective. So the insider perspective is you. You are the worker, and you know how to best do your job. And the outsider perspective is your bitch-ass manager who's like, what the fuck? Uh, do that faster. And you're like, dude, I'm already doing it fast enough. And they're like, uh, no. Do it faster. Do it better. Do it now. And you're like... Okay? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um... I got a lot of, like... fun metaphors tonight, I feel. It's very fun. We're ha we're having a lot of fun, I think. Um, so yeah, uh, the desire to move beyond the text, beyond text, to seek understandings of writing which cannot be so derived solely from the expert or 
poetic analysis of the text was the key driver in the work of some early researchers in the field who were conscious of the limitations of formal linguistic analysis alone. Ooh, ho, ho, ho. Juicy. We are throwing these. I'm going on. Are we throwing shade? I don't know if this is. I don't know if throwing shade is appropriate. I, I feel like there was some shade that was thrown. Um. Anyway. Given its concern with the production and evaluation of academic texts, AC Lit's research necessarily incorporates an interest in texts as part of broader, open-ended data generation. However, the ways in which texts are analyzed in any given study varies considerably. An indication of the range is provided by the work of Ivanik, whose study of eight student writers involved extensive textual analysis, using CDA, SFL, and frames from Goffman, alongside other data such as interviews with students and tutors and institutional documentation, 1998. A later study, in contrast, focused primarily on tracing UK further education students' vernacular literacy practices, employing a range of creative data gathering instruments, such as annotated floor plans and photoethnographies, Mannion and Ivanic, 2007, but with relatively little close attention to the characteristics of the texts students were producing in college, but see Ivanic, 2006. Others have focused on the multimodal Afro dances and constraints of vernacular and official forms of academic text making for knowledge production, e.g. Thiessen, 2001, Archer, 2006, English, 2011. Some studies have focused on the dynamic processes of text production, using notions such as text histories and text trajectories to track antextualization and recontextualization practices. In such studies, e.g. Lillis and Curry, 2010, analytic attention is placed on identifying key features of academic texts as well as tracking how and when such features come into being in the process of text production. It's possible to see a continuum of research focus within AC Lit's where the role of textual data varies depending on the particular empirical focus. They actually get mad at you if you don't stack the boxes and instead, like, burn them in the incinerator. Um, I like to burn the boxes in the incinerator uh, because I like lighting things on fire. Focus in on researcher orientations and backgrounds. The question of the role of text analysis within the overarching ethnographic framework, and the relationship between texts and practices, is still a richly problematic and contested oh, one. Fuck. Lillis, 2008, drawing on linguistic ethnography, e.g. Rampton, 2007, has argued for more context-sensitive categories for analyzing texts, more consistent with an ethnographic epistemology, for example using notions such as indecicality and orientation, indecicality. academic literacies and EAP. Ooh. This brief account of the key That's concerns of AC Lit's points to a number of shared motivations with the field of EAP writ. What is indexicality? Of course, this is just going to give us the dictionary. But, you know. Let's see. In semiotics, linguistics, anthropology, and philosophy of language, indexicality is the phenomenon of a sign pointing to or indexing some object in the context in which it occurs. Ooh. Hmm. How do we use that in a sentence? Shit. Uh, the phenomenon of a sign pointing to or indexing some object in context. Um, I want to. I want to say it's the the consequences uh, for completing the job versus the rewards for completing the job. Um. Let's see, what's indexical what's what is indexicality example? You may refer to one person in one context and to another person in another context. Okay, okay, okay. So gender neutral pronouns. They can refer to me, but they could also refer to my Twitch chat if I had enough chatters chatting at the same time for it to be considered more than one person chatting. That feels necessar unnecessarily complicated. Okay, they can refer to me individually, but they can also refer to the classroom. Yeah, to the classroom that I'm in for this class. So we're all in the classroom together. Okay, okay, okay. Um... Indexicality refers to a token that refers to an object, not because it is visually similar, nor because it is analogous, but rather because the token is associated with the same general traits and connotations. Oh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Hmm. 
token that refers to an object um, because it's visually similar. This is anal analogous rather because the token is associated with the same general traits and connotation. Okay, so consequences. There will be consequences for that F that you got on the paper, right? There's going to be consequences. Now, consequences can mean in certain situations that you're being rewarded. But you understand that a token, consequences, refers to an object which is negative repercussions, not because it's visually similar, and not because it looks like it, not because it actually means that, but because we associate consequences with negative things. We have connotations that are negative, negative connotations. Okay, okay. Words mean different things in different situations. <laughs> I, I love these papers because it's like everybody is just finding all of these different ways to say the same thing, and it's, it's really fun to like notice that. Um, anyway, academic literacy is an EAP. Let's go. EAP writ large, but also to a number of differences. Yeah. It's important to consider the similarities and differences, <clears throat> identifying in particular the intellectual space in which AC um, lists in a specific hours. tradition within EAP, oh critical EAP, converge. Needless to say, this is an ongoing debate and what we offer is one perspective here. Both fields have arisen out of practitioner-led concerns and an interest in bringing theory and empirical research to bear to help students, and increasingly academics, to succeed as writers and communicators in the increasingly globalist, English-dominant academy. They well, share an interest in foregrounding the often tacit nature of academic conventions and in making these visible. Researchers in both fields have also emphasized the importance of investigating academic literacy as a highly situated practice. EAP has been interested in investigating the detailed discoursal requirements of different disciplines which is echoed in the attention to academic literacy as social practice in AC Lit's work. As a corollary, in both EAP and AC Lit's research, the target or valued rhetorical practices of any particular context have been the object of empirical inquiry, rather than assumed. Indeed, a shared overarching. Goal in EAP, evidenced by chapters in this volume, and AC Litz has been to foreground the constitutive role of language in the academy, challenging its often marginal positioning in academic work, Turner, 2011b. Nevertheless, there are key differences between EAP and AC Litz in the stances towards the phenomena being explored. The key object or phenomenon under exploration in EAP tends to be the text whereas in AC Litz it tends to be the producer or meaning maker. In an attempt to make visible academic conventions, there is a tendency in EAP to repeat such conventions and in so doing construe them as relatively fixed. AC Litz sees such conventions as always contested slash able. The explicit language of focus in EAP is English, with the target linguistic medium, English. Hold on a second. In an, to make, in an attempt to make visible academic conventions, there is a tendency in EAP to reify such conventions, and in so doing, construe them as relatively fixed. So, um, you ever learn how to write a hook? Yeah, when you're writing a, when you're writing a, um, you know, your first English paper in high school, your first English essay in high school, and your teacher is like, this is what you're going to do. First, you're going to write your introductory paragraph. It's going to be about five sentences. Then, you're going to write a body paragraph. You're going to need two of them. And each of those body paragraphs are going to have topic sentences. And then each of those topic sentences are going to have um, a uh, supporting sentence. And then you're going to have your ev two evidence sentences. And then you're going to have another supporting sentence. And then you're going to have two more evidence, you know, citation, quote, sentences. And then you're going to have a closing sentence. You're gonna have one more of those paragraphs, and um, maybe two. I think it's like three body paragraphs, and then one. Uh, then you're gonna have your um, closing paragraph, and your closing paragraph is gonna restate your introductory paragraph. Yeah, you you know you learned that. I learned that. I don't use that. I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> um, I, 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 yeah, that's not how I write papers anymore, and I'm, yeah, I'm getting, my, I'm getting my, um, you know, MA, so.
Visible academic conventions. Um, you know, we can have a, because it's hard to teach somebody without knowing what to teach them, right? So it's like, what the fuck are we supposed to teach? Well, teach them to write a hamburger. <laughs> um, you ever learn to re re write the hamburger? There's the, the, the topic sentence, that's the bun. And then there's like the meat, which is the, the, you know, the supporting sentence, you know, your, your statements, whatever. And then there's the lettuce and the tomato, that's like your, your evidence, back it up. And then there's the bottom bun, which is your conclusion sentence, right? We are turning these things into formulas when no sensible, reasonable adult person would ever write like that if they wanted to be taken seriously by other sensible adult people. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and then what does that do? That, that creates this, sen this sense for people that these um, conventions, these conventions are, are relatively fixed, that these conventions are useful. In reality, the hamburger style paragraph is only as useful as it is for getting good grades in writing second grade hamburger style paragraphs. And when you move past second grade, that's not going to help you. It's not going to help you. Um, the, the writing, the, the essay, you know, the hook and the, the, uh, topic, or not topic sentence, the hook and the, you know, introductory paragraph, and then the three body paragraphs that are very highly structured, um, that's only gonna work for you until you graduate high school. Um, because these things, writing is not quite so structured as we want it to be. Um, I mean, if you think about it in Twitter context, if you turn your everyday language and everyday communication into tweets, people are going to look at you like you're fucking insane. Because it's just like, it's a tweet. We are speaking in a specific discord, discord, a specific discourse, not a generally, a generally accepted convention, right? The discourse of second grade hamburger paragraphs, the discourse of high school essay, um, and even the literary essay itself is the specific discourse of literary essay, not the specific discourse of the general discourse of literary and biology essay. No, it's the specific discourse of literary essay. Um, let's go. <clears throat> English, construed in a very specific way way, albeit often implicitly that is, as a stable linguistic resource, as standard, academic, English and as used by assumed native speakers dash. In contrast, in AC Lits, the specific nature and status of English has been explicitly challenged, not least because the focus on non-traditional students and their desires for vernacular English, ES, necessarily problematize common sense assumptions about there being one kind of native speaker or one kind of acceptable native, academic, English. In EAP the overriding metaphor adopted to describe students' participation has been that of novice expert trajectory. Whilst this metaphor is also used in AC Lits, the emphasis tends to be on the diversity of life experiences and knowledges brought by students into the academy which challenges any simple dichotomies between novice and expert. The ideological orientation Ooh. towards pedagogy differs in emphasis in EAP and AC Lits. EAP research, whether in EAP or disciplinary specific spaces, usually operates from the stand- Challenges. Where did it go? Where did it go? What the hell? Which challenges any simple dichotomies between novice and expert. Now, in the great world of Twitch, you might be an expert at meme making in the Hasanabi community, but if you go over to some other community, you're not gonna know how to make their memes immediately, now are ya? You're gonna have to sit around for a while. You're gonna have to sit down and listen until you can effectively make good memes in that community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just like, I'm just like thinking, I'm like imagining now, like, of essays as memes, and like, like, um, you know, English majors is just like the biggest shit posters of history. 
And I like it. I like it. I like it. I love it. I need more Standpoint of it. that once target conventions, genres, and discourses are identified, students can and should be inducted into these. Flexibility is valued but primarily in terms of the student's ability to manage existing conventions, thus students are encouraged to be agile adapters, navigating the expectations of different audiences, e.g. C. Belcher, 2009. In AC Litz, on the other hand, shift and change are seen as inherent in academic discourse itself, and agility and responsiveness the responsibility of academic communities and gatekeepers as well as of students. The EAP orientation to pedagogy has been described as normative, Lillis and Scott, 2007, in contrast to the transformative orientation in AC Litz. What is meant by transformative and how this connects with the orientation of a key strand of EAP, critical EAP, is discussed below. Of course, in pointing to differences here we are foregrounding what we see as mainstream EAP, some aspects of which have been strongly challenged yeah. from within EAP itself, notably, critical EAP, oh, G. Benish, 2001, Turner, 2004, 2012. In the final section below we summarize what we see as key convergence between AC Litz and critical EAP. Future directions, a converging space critical EAP and AC Litz. Rather than assume the two fields can straightforwardly be combined or their differences collapsed, as in Wingate and Tribble, 2012, it's important to be aware of where convergence between EAP and AC lists lie. The key convergence is an ideological orientation, signaled by the use of critical and critical EAP and literacies in AC lists. We highlight what we see as key convergence and future directions for research into academic literacy practices in academia. Rethinking the producer. As Highland points out, 2014, critical EAP involves a shift from a rationalistic approach to needs analysis, towards a language pedagogy built on rights analysis as set out by Benish. Critical EAP allows ESL teachers and students to examine externally imposed demands and negotiate their responses to them, by addressing the following questions, who formulated these requirements and why? Should they be fulfilled? Should they be modified? What are the consequences of trying to change current conditions? What is gained by obeying, and what is lost? 2001, P53. This opening up of such questions is strongly echoed in AC Lit's work in ongoing debates about how to involve producers in choices around academic meaning making. <laughs> Rethinking Please the linguistic boy. and semiotic resources for academic meaning making challenges to monolingualist assumptions for academic meaning making have long been voiced in AC Lit's and EAP work, particularly from multilingual contexts such as South Africa, often engaging directly with work in the fields of contrasted rhetoric and second language writing, Angelo Carter, 1998. Key questions being asked in critical EAP and AC lists include the following, whose English, ES, are slash should be valued and why? Where and how can slash should vernacular language and literacy practices, including code meshing, be used in academic knowledge making? To what extent can and should a broader range of linguistic and modal resources be used in academic knowledge making? English, 2011, Horner ETAL, 2011, Lillis and Curry, 2010, Pennycook, 1997. Whilst there is some work teasing out these questions, there is considerably more to be done. Rethinking trajectories once the academic space is construed as contested in terms of whose voices and knowledges can get to be heard, relying on a default metaphor of apprenticeship, from novice to expert becomes questionable. Work focusing on both the student writer, e.g. Angelo Carter, 1998, and professional academic writers, e.g. Kanagaraja, 2002, Flower Du and Lee, 2009, Lillis and Curry, 2010, problematizes any straightforward positioning of writers and reader evaluators within the academy as novices or experts, pointing instead to a diverse range of expertise and trajectories. Work on the academic practices of scholars, rather than students, in particular foregrounds the ways in which presumed trajectories, and therefore assumptions about the writer and reader, are mediated by stratification between the global center and peripheries, see Kanagaraja, 2002, Lillis and Curry, 2010. Rethinking research methodologies whilst there has been important ethnographically oriented work in EAP, notably Swales, 1998, also Flower Du and Lee, 2009, Johns, 1997, the overriding focus has been on texts in EAP and on practices in AC Litz. There is considerable convergence in recent calls for the need for methodologies which enable holistic accounts of texts and practices, Highland, 2014, Lillis, 2008, as well as for dialogic and collaborative methodologies, E. G. Johns and Makayla, 2011, Lillis and Rye, 2011, Thiessen and Cooper, 2014. The challenge of developing a methodology which takes account of text and practice and engages at micro, Wait, meso, cool. and macro levels of analysis is ongoing. This is full Rethinking stuff, writing as a networked it? activity. Oh, Empirical awesome. approaches to writing as social practice taken up in AC Litz and critical EAP problematize the predominant focus on the individual writer, foregrounding the many participants in text production. For example, Lillis and Curry's longitudinal study of scholars publishing in English and other languages throws light on the key role of literacy brokers, on writing for publication as a networked activity, and the nature of English as a networked resource. A very different study by Tuck, 2012, 2013, focuses on the role of tutors and assessors, rather than students in shaping undergraduate writing on its way towards the final assessed product. Harwood et al., 2012, and Turner, 2011a, have foregrounded the role of proofreading in text production. 
work focusing on digital literacies highlights the need to reconceptualize what it means to produce academic texts, challenging distinctions between writing and reading, e.g. Lee and Jones, 2010. Rethinking Great. pedagogy as transformation. Both AC Lits and Critical EAP emphasize the need for transformation in pedagogy and orientations to language and academic Barrel. production. See for example Special Issue of Journal of English for Academic Barrel. Purposes, 8, 2, 2009 and Lillis ETALEDS, forthcoming. What transformation means in specific contexts of production is necessarily a point of debate but key principles can be summarized as follows. Negotiation and dialogue should be central to the teaching learning, production and evaluation of what counts as academic writing orientations to what count as appropriate linguistic and semiotic resources that producers bring to meaning making in the academy need to be expanded to include multimodality, multi and translingualism, vernacular, and official practices in general, core conceptual categories such as English and academic need to be explored rather than taken as given, given the multiple patterns of mobility in an increasingly transnational academia and the complex nature of recognizing diversity in academic production, Warner, forthcoming, rethinking risk in the academy, Implicit in the drive to open up the academy is the need to rethink risk most obviously what is risked, and by whom, by questioning existing conventions. A recent collection of papers by South African researchers tackles this challenge head-on seeking to theorize risk in the context of postgraduate research writing. Thiessen and Cooper argue against a reductive framing of risk, exemplified by the sector's increasing attention to plagiarism and to research ethics approval, which they argue highlights what is acceptable rather than what is possible. Authors offer a productive Ooh. concept of risk as a tilting point between self and other, between are you against reductive framing of risk exemplified by the sector's increasing attention to plagiarism and to research ethics approval, which they argue highlights what is acceptable rather than what is all oh, what is possible? Mm. Oh, mm. Mm. that's that's tasty. That's um. Need to rethink risk most obviously what is risk and by whom by questioning existing conventions oh my god oh boy oh boy oh boy <laughs> um yeah no this is this is this is fun um I, and i i that Okay, so when we think about, like, language, right? When we think about the hard line def definitions of, you know, consequences, right? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do that a lot. That's, like, that's the one that I've got in my mind right now, right? Consequences. And all the definitions and the connotations and the meaning, right? What's the problem with consequences just being a bad thing? What is the problem with just the quickial definition of consequences being that word? Because there are plenty of other words, you know, the results, right? Results is pretty neutral. Um, what are the results of, I mean, I guess, you know, you ever had a, a you know, you took a test and then you got bad results and then there were consequences. <laughs> but, you know, what is the risk? What are we risking when we change language? We're not really risking anything. Because language changes, forms of teaching and learning change. That's, that's kind of the whole point of, you know, being alive is change. And some people have this anxiety about change, that change, you know, risks things. What are we risking? Are we risking the, you know, the, um, the value of the institution? Well, if changing the meaning of the word consequences can completely destroy the institution, is it really that great of an institution? Um, you know, these are things that we have to, to ask ourselves. Like, if, if, if being a Twitch streamer <laughs> and a grad student at the same time is going to destroy the, the efficacy of grad studentry in America, <laughs> then what's the value of being a grad student, you know? I don't know. I don't know. And I, I mean, I hope, would hope that the, the, the value of the studying things is, I, I would hope studying things is the value. But at the same time, we have conventions, we have existing um, conventions that would tell us that no, you, you, you need to not risk. You can't do, you can't take risks. Like, I think all of human, you know, creation, human existence is 
we act risk taking. Um, we are risking things just, you know, sitting in our living rooms, you know. What if a plane falls on your house? Think about that. I'm agoraphobic. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, increasing attention to plagiarism and to research ethics approval, which highlights what is acceptable rather than what is possible. So we're too worried about, you know, um, and we see this, we see this when it comes to, um, let's talk about Marvel. <laughs> there are a lot of, uh, or not, not, a, not even Marvel, not even Marvel, because I don't think, I think Marvel is, is, um, is, you know, different characters and different pieces of universe. No, um, what is it called? What is it called? Reboots. Um, people are, the, the, not people, um, industries, movie studios are making reboots because they are, I mean, they definitely are, um, trying to capitalize on, um, well, they're trying to capitalize. <laughs> they're trying to make money, right? They're trying to, to, um, reach your, your feelings of nostalgia for the old films and then, you know. Hopefully you will buy tickets to the new ones, and then they will become popular. And, you know, there's the extraneous nature of the, the changing film industry and the difference between, you know, streaming and and going to the theater and, and streaming and buying a DVD and how these things are changing. And so, of course, movies are kind of becoming worse because they kind of have to in order to reach the mass audience that is required to make the money back, right? So when we have, you know, the increasing intention to plagiarism, we're so worried um, that, you know, they're making too many reboots of things that um, we are forgetting about, you know, what is possible to do with a reboot, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that's not, that, maybe that's not such a great, maybe that's not such a great metaphor there. But I, I think, I think, you know, I think that we, as a culture, we have been very focused on, like, plagiarism and, like, doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. Oh, my God. And, like, I hate to tell you, babe, but that we're humans. That's what we do. We see somebody doing a thing and our primordial rat brain is like, I want to do that, too. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, um, so yeah, what is acceptable rather than what is possible? Uh, let's go, let's go. Between the production and reception of the written word, 2014, 15, a notion explored in different ways through a series of chapters based around empirical and pedagogic work with postgraduate student writers. Whilst we identify convergence here, we also recognize that such convergence are often not signaled by writers, with some exceptions, including Harwood, Bloom, and Street, Turner, and writers whose work focuses on writing for publication, e.g. Kanagaraja, Lewis, and Curry. There is a danger that researchers no slash pedagogues stay separate, <laughs> on the basis of whether English is considered it's to be, by that, researchers, the first or primary language or second, additional, or foreign language, categorizations which both AC Litz and critical EAP researchers have actively interrogated. In researching what it means to do academic writing and reading in a globalist academy, it will be important that researchers with shared interests and ideological concerns engage with that each other's like work, dirt. both in order that to avoid like working. Uh -oh. Within conceptual boundaries, they uh -oh. don't seek to disrupt and as a means to develop richer understandings okay. of knowledge making in the contemporary world. References Angelo okay. Carter, S. 1998. Access to success, literacy in academic contexts. Okay. Okay. Cape Town, University of Cape Town Press. Archer, A. 2006. Yeah, Change it looks like animal. I might be having, like, students multimodal issues. semiotic resources in an engineering curriculum. Um, in Thiessen and Van Pletsen, EDS, OPCIT, 130 see. to 150 yeah, Barton, D, be, M. Hamilton okay, and R. Ivanek, EDS 2000. Uh, I'm going to try London, Ralph Ledge, Bainham, M. 2000. Uh, Academic shit, writing in new and emergent that. disciplinary well, wait, no, areas. In Lee and Steerer, EDS, yeah. OPCIT, 17 to 31. Bainham M. and M. Prince Lou, 2001 New Directions in Literacy it, Research, an Language and Education 15, 2-383-91, to 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 Bazerman, C. 1988, Shaping Written Knowledge, The Genre and Activity of the Experimental Article in Science, Madison, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Press, okay. Belcher, D. 2009, oh my God. How Research Space is Created <laughs> in a Diverse Research World, Journal of Second Language Writing 18, 221-34, to 34. Is this toilet? Benish, S. 2001, oh my God, it's a toilet! English for Academic Purposes. 
Lala, NJ, Lawrence Earl oh. Baum. Associates. Ah. Boss, C2009. Okay. Exploring academic um. Um. So, yeah. Conceptual... Um. I don't. Ow. Oh my god, I just popped the hell out of my jaw. I don't know if you could hear that. Um. But, yeah. That's. The last paper. <laughs> so, um, it only took us three hours and 12 minutes <laughs> to make it through three papers. <laughs> Which is. I'm gonna be real, that's about what I expected it to be. Um, but yeah, I, um, I had a really good time. I had a really good time. I wasn't sure how this format was gonna work out, but I'm feeling really optimistic about it, and I'm really excited to do it in the future. Um, and as to what my professor's gonna think, um, hopefully, you know, you don't hate it. Um, <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? Um, but, um, yeah, thank you for joining. Uh, we're gonna keep going, we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna play more games. Um, I, I don't think we're gonna play more of this game. I actually, I was gonna move on to Alice Madness. It has been three hours. I know that a chapter of Alice Madness is about, um, oh shit, I think it's like three hours. So, um, let's see, final, let's just do some final thoughts. Let's, let's go back and do some final thoughts. In researching what it means to do academic writing and reading in a globalized academy, it will be academy. It will be important that researchers with shared interests and ideological concerns engage with each, other, with each other's work, both in order to avoid working within conceptual boundaries they seek to disrupt, the means to develop richer understandings of knowledge making in the contemporary world. Hmm. Oh, and as a means. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I think, I don't think we need final thoughts. I think, I think, I think that is a pretty good mic drop. I think that is a pretty good mic drop. Um, so yeah, about this new particular format we're going for, I'm planning on Wednesdays being our day for this. We're going to start off the stream with our little, you know, reading and some kind of game. I'm not going to do the, the, the visceral cleanup detail every day because I think my professor um, doesn't like scary games. Uh, <laughs> oops, sorry. Sorry. Um, I mean, it's not scary. It's just gory. Okay. It's just gory. I don't think. But anyway. Um... Uh, I, I am going to invite the other, um, you know, other people from the class to join, and hopefully they will, um, and hopefully they'll even, like, participate in the chat, because I think that would be so cool, um, because like I said, I, you know, my big thing here is learning through play, so, like, you know, learning through community, learning through play, so, like, wouldn't it be fucking amazing if we could have, like, a bunch of grad students, like, you know, doing video games and, like, shooting the shit about a paper that we're all, like, listening to at the same time. I don't know. I think that would be fucking fun. I think that would be fucking fun. Um, is it gonna happen? I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know? But we do what we can with what we got. So, maybe. Maybe. We'll see what we can do. Um, but yeah. So, if you enjoyed this segment, if you liked it, if you want more, let me know. Let me know. Because this is, this is, you know, this is what I've been wanting to do um, for, like, a while. And I'm so excited to, like, finally be doing it and to re be realizing, you know, in the process of realizing that not only is it possible, but it's, like, really fun. It's really fun. Uh, I keep looking at the camera and it's really weird, but, like, yeah. I'm having a fun time. Um, so thank you for joining me. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a short break. And in that short break, I'm going to probably shove food into my face. Um, I'm also going to um, clean up all the tabs on my desktop. 
And then we're going to switch to a new game. Um, and I know I already said that, and I'm, like, repeating something I already said. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we're going to switch to a new game. I will decide whether it's Alice Madness or, um, 817. So 8, 8, 9, 10, 11. Let's do Alice. We're gonna do Alice. We're gonna do Alice. Um, yeah. So, I'll see you in like, you know, a few minutes. A few minutes. Be right back. <laughs> 